Welcome to Indie 88, Toronto's <laughs> most popular Blink-155 podcast radio station. I'm your host, Sam Sutherland. <laughs> Just, yeah, make sure that you acknowledge every line in case, that way it can be played on both, uh, both mediums <laughs> and then it'll be fine. Uh, Josiah, we were talking before we started recording about how, you know, a little, a little behind the curtain, it's Tuesday as we're recording this, the episode's going to come out on Friday, and... In the two days of this week, we have experienced more news, more activity than maybe our entire lives. I feel like the last two days have been the best year of my life. <laughs> so, so one thing, and this is, you know, t- to tease a little bit, is this week's guest, of course, a big surprise, unless you've actually looked at the title of the episode you've downloaded. <laughs> That's one thing that unfolded this week. Or the- if you follow him on Twitter, he spoiled it immediately, so... Uh- I mean, yeah. Well, I think I'm I'm going to name drop him at the end of the intro. So a little uh, <laughs> teaser for the teaser. Oh, wow. Wow. It's a teaser inception. I love it. Yeah. But Te- more importantly than that, I mean, uh, <laughs> we've been joking that we want, like, a pod enemy. And we've tried, <laughs> we've tried starting beef with the Alkaline Trio podcast. And they refused to acknowledge that we exist because then they would have to admit that, that we're – that they're merely our reflection <laughs> right? Um, yeah. but we have uh, i never even considered that our worthy adversary could be in the realm of alternative rock radio it's true terrestrial radio was you know not where we were looking but you know sometimes you find love in the most unexpected places and that's what happened <laughs> uh to you and i you and I this week <laughs> do you want to kind of describe the the flurry of activity I, that unfolded <laughs> earlier this week well, here's the other funny thing is like because we live in two separate time zones, A, mm-hmm. and because we're dealing with a morning radio host, all of these things are happening while I'm in like deep REM sleep. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so so because you were asleep and I was truly uh, you know, manning the guns for the pod at 7 in the morning Eastern time. <laughs> yeah. I guess it, it. I guess it started yesterday, right? On, it started on yesterday. Monday it started morning. On, on Monday morning, beginning of the week. There's that crisp. So friend of the pod, <laughs> friend of the pod, Josh O'Kane, who you may know, uh, he shouted at us out on the Globe and Mail, and he's also always telling Bill Billingsley to stop tweeting and driving because he's quite a narc. Yeah, um, but, and he's promised me he's he's going to be a guest on the pod soon. Uh, he's a, a great reporter, and, and what he did on Monday was nothing short of great reporting. And he's promised us, uh, the nation, documents, <laughs> Blink-182 documents that he unearthed with his a- actual uh, you know journalism skills. And so that's coming up in a future episode. So, so Josh O'Kane's going to be in this world for a minute. He's a regular at the Pint and the Pageman. <laughs> It's the meanest thing you could have possibly said about him, but sure, go ahead. <laughs> well, I'm just saying he's a good journalist. Yeah. <laughs> That's all. <laughs> being a good journalist is like being a good host of a Blink-182 podcast. Right, like, yeah. You know, That's, that's there's fair. There's a ceiling. There's a ceiling. Yeah. So Josh is <laughs> listening to the radio in the morning and uh, hears on Toronto alt-rock radio station Indy 88 our, your, Josiah, interview clip with Cone from Sum 41 uh, discussing this mysterious origin story for In Too Deep, which has carried us through multiple episodes. It's a new story that's been picked up by Exclaim, by Noisy. Uh, this is really how we made our mark as a podcast, is this <laughs> <laughs> this Sum 41. Until this week. Until, this, until week. this week. For, yeah. and, and so Josh hears uh, Indie 88 on their morning show play this this clip with Cohn explaining... This this mysterious into deep origin story, and then proceeds to not credit the pod. Doesn't doesn't mention that it came from a podcast interview. Doesn't utter the words Blink One Fifty Five. And so Josh like, O'Kane. I wish I could. I wish I could have heard that because how do you even segue without crediting? Like I don't even understand how that's possible. Like on our <laughs> podcast, we credit YouTube users named like uh, Wicked Basket Man Seventy Eight. <laughs> <laughs> and he has 10 followers and we still make sure that we spell out his username correctly because yeah. it's fucked up to, to not credit your sources. It's yeah. insane. Especially, you know, it's not just saying, hey, I read this online and sort of a story that someone else broke. I mean, the the point of this is, and, and look, I want to make this clear. I think this is funny. I'm actually laughing, 
but you know they. So you're at the phase of online med where you're saying you actually think it's funny. Yeah, exactly. So, and I've been there <laughs> since day one because I'm uh, very good at uh, masking my emotions with increasingly more obvious emotions, and <laughs> you know they, they downloaded the podcast, edited it, and you know put it on the radio, and then managed to to sort of not say Blink One Fifty Five, which when you then called them out for, they had something of a meek excuse, I believe. I think actually that was that was Josh calling them out and they said <laughs> they responded to Josh and said they didn't mention our name for the sake of brevity. <laughs> yeah. I mean, you got to count all the to way to fair, 155 and that's that's it's a pretty too long much time. title, especially yeah, especially if you're saying blink 155 podcast.bigcartel.com or whatever <laughs> right. long it would elongated just, version of our It would get garbled. It would get quite garbled. And so as a result, the last 24 hours have been, um, you know, <laughs> us, all the friends of the pod, uh, people I didn't realize were friends of the pod, um, the multiple fan accounts that now exist on Twitter, just <laughs> right. endlessly berating the Twitter account <laughs> for this radio station. At one point, friend of the pod, the merch pundit himself, Marsden, started the hashtag uh, justice <laughs> yeah. for Blake 155 pod. And it, I just want to clarify that I'm – on an even deeper level of not mad, actually, I find it funny <laughs> right. than you. Yeah. But I also love to not let things go, especially when you're dealing with a brand and especially when you're dealing with, like, uh, the the audio equivalent of, like, a red cup party among wakeboarders, which is right. uh, rock radio. I mean, it's just, like, these are just, like, this is – we're dealing with lake country here, I believe. So <laughs> yeah. I just really don't ever want to let it go until we get, like, a written apology or something. Yeah. We're, I want to get, like, a, a note from a lawyer apologizing. Like, I want a notarized <laughs> apology. And the difference between you and I is that, you know, I, I – I'm not going to pretend that I wasn't. I was like supremely irked by it. And I'm saying irked to try to mask the fact that I was more than irked by it. Cause I'm like, it's just so easy. You just don't like steal stuff. And it, it, it made also me would kinda, make them it, seem, it would make them seem cool if they're like, yeah, this is from blink One Fifty Five. that like fucking cool ass podcast. That's that right. Everyone's talking about. That's right. It's I'm a, in it's the a, know. It's a wink at the cool ones. Whereas you, the one actually running the campaign seemingly from our Twitter account <laughs> are the one who is totally not mad. Like you are tickled pink by this entire situation. I love it because I love when someone fucks up and we just have the upper hand and we can just run it into the ground. Yeah. Which I think great. at the point where, you know, at Sutherland memes was offering to represent us legally. Uh, we had maybe reached that point. So, yeah. And then they said something about the death penalty. And I'm like, well, let's not say death. Yeah, death, that was, I was, I was like liking everyone's supportive tweets. Cause I thought they were funny, but at some point I was like, this is going to look really petty because in 80 is 88 is getting all these alerts that it's like when people are like, boo them. And it's like, 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 but the one I did not like was the suggestion that anyone deserved the death penalty. Cause I just didn't want that on my conscience. <laughs> Although even uh, like the merch pundit has been in my iMessage since this happened too, and he did point out that like, you know, stealing from us is one thing. And this is obviously a very stupid idea for a podcast, and our very existence is genuinely stupid. Yes, but what else agree. have they been? St what else have they been stealing? Who else have they been stealing from? I mean, if because uh, I don't know if we want to get into it, but we've seen some. We've seen like. The other thing is we know everyone in Canada. There's like eight people who work in Canadian media, and we know them all between us. We so. have already had an Indie 88 host on this podcast. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like, we know literally everyone. And so I don't know if – yeah. Uh, no, like I mean, look, seen... <laughs> this is a, a, a radio <laughs> station your that decision. literally has a reputation for stealing content, stealing photos for their online posts. Um, and presumably also stealing stuff on the radio. So they thought they could get away with this because we're like this very, very stupid project from two true idiots. But, you know, the fact is, I think 50% of our audience is Canadian music journalists. And so one of them is going to hear it <laughs> and be angry about it. But we only even know about this because Josh O'Kane's alarm clock is set to Indy 88. If that doesn't happen, right. then the last 24 hours of hashtag justice for Blink 155 don't even transpire. So on, on a very real level, it's like, yeah, just credit people. Like, I, I'm not profoundly wronged by it. I just, but I do think it's like, just say sorry instead of saying it was for brevity. Uh, 
but then also it's hilarious. So it's fine. I'm fine. Well, the other thing about it, Sam, and the thing that did make me almost flip into being actually mad, but not quite mad. But right, and this is why I'm a little more activated because I feel like I'm going to come across as unreasonable here. (laughs) Yeah, like because we know everyone in Canada, we we see every Facebook post, we see every tweet because it's just a small group of people who all know each other and secretly hate each other slash want to fuck each other mm-hmm. i think is that a safe way to describe canadian media couldn't be um, more accurate if you tried <laughs> so somehow i saw this post someone from the station was sort of feeling sorry for themselves that they were being t- attacked by an army of like 155 yeah. trolls <laughs> Which I feel like is a problem that's going to emerge more and more often as this pod continues. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but, but, the, but they said that they thought that they shouldn't have had to credit us because we only have like 600 followers on Twitter or whatever. Yeah, and, and that's when it got to me. That's, that is like – the brevity thing was already like hilariously stupid. And then to say that you don't need to credit someone because the, they only have 600 Twitter followers, which like, bro – have you seen our our engagement on that shit? You know, the ratios like, are tight. You know, like, come on. It's there's quality. like 600 people who don't sleep just to talk about <laughs> this podcast all the time. Yeah. And, and, you know, we are blessed to have you all committing to a one-sided flame war with this radio station. But, yeah, it was, it was a bit of a thing where I was like, okay, it was just like super funny and everyone was having fun with it. And then we see this Facebook post that is like, I mean – this pop punk podcast taking themselves too seriously, which which also <laughs> makes me feel like if we were like a true crime podcast, would you have to credit us? Because, of course, crime is very uh, serious. I mean, I, I think we quite literally are now a true crime podcast as of right now. <laughs> wow. Because of this. <laughs> this is exciting. <laughs> and I mean, look, in the end, I'm, I'm going to uh, we got to move on because we have. A lot, a lot going on this week. A lot to get. Well, the thing that this is why I'm going to name drop. I'll explain why he's on the podcast later on. But the thing is, we are now as relevant, if not more relevant than all alternative rock radio. We're getting so we gets. need to establish some rules because this week, by some divine intervention, <laughs> our guest is the singer of the band Imagine Dragons, Dan Reynolds, <laughs> which is just like, oh, it's, it's, it's like the most insane thing that's ever happened. And you'll learn why later, dear listener. But, but what I'm trying to say is like, he says some shit that other people who actually care more about Imagine Dragons might want to pick up. And I just want to say right now, if you do, please credit us. And if you're Indie 88, you're not allowed to post our audio. <laughs> That's good. Because, look, in the end, I- I'm trying to be calm. Like, I, I don't I want to take the high road. It's obvious that I'm a little a little activated. But in the end, I think if you compile the, the Facebook post and having to sort of walk it back on Twitter, yeah, it is Indie 88 and not us that comes away looking like a bit of an ass. Thenia. Thenia? Uh, yeah. <laughs> what? So if you want to hear the last six Sam, minutes, Sam, I'm so <laughs> <laughs> sorry. Uh, me yelling at Josiah. Um, I think what did we just say? We're gonna add like a hundred dollar a month exclusive tier. Hundred dollar tier. You can hear the. You can. I think when the technology exists, we'll do like a five hundred dollar tier where you can just be. You can hear our thoughts. <laughs> yeah, but you know, though, I do think this is interesting because I did uh, suggest earlier in chat that we should plug the Patreon because we have. Two, I think, really great exclusives coming this month. We're going to keep sort of leaning on those more because people have actually been incredibly generous. But also, we're going to be in a lawsuit soon. We're going to need all the support that we can get in our <laughs> in our legal battle um, against uh, the wakeboarding red solo cups of this city. So, if you can if you can chip in what you can, and I think we do need to add this extra tier where the stuff that we cut out, where we get like too real and say things that are libelous. Maybe maybe we'll make those available. So right, if you're interested. Anyway, so asthenia is that I I fucking said it differently than you. Well, what I was gonna say was I was already planning on uh, pointing out that it has the word ass in it when you pronounce it. Um, I was gonna say that's why I picked it, and then you went ahead and did that. So I think great minds. This is why we're such a 
growing uh, journalistic enterprise because <laughs> yeah. of these thoughts. <laughs> these are these are thoughts that are worth stealing. <laughs> so you say as as asthenia. I mean, I'll be I'll be totally honest with you and with the listeners of Blink One Fifty Five and uh, you know the hosts of Indie Eighty Eight right now. I have never said this song title out loud until that that moment, that transition. So I, I, I was just fishing in the dark. Well, okay. Luckily, uh, there's a few different things that popped up of how to pronounce it. So let's hear this. <laughs> Great. <laughs> they call this dead air on professional radio. Oh. <laughs> you just talked over the goddamn thing. <laughs> <Sorry>. <laughs> All right, let's try it again. Asthenia. Asthenia. Why does she sound like a fairy that's been trapped? Because that's like a fairy that's been trapped kind of word, I think. Yeah. And then I you have to right, decode it, you know? Is, this word is popping off on deviant art as well, so that's that would explain it because it's <clears> totally a very um a very fairy ass word, but I was gonna say you're right. The dead air. Like if you're gonna up, if you're gonna start an account, this is just a little bit of advice, industry advice for uh, the YouTube pronunciation community. Maybe don't have ten seconds of silence at the start of your of your uh, pronunciation video. <laughs> yeah, you're really gonna mess up podcasts that need to learn how to pronounce the songs of the bands that they've dedicated three years of their lives to. <laughs> Wasn't it good when I uh, didn't know what year they started when I was talking to Cone? That was a good part. <laughs> I saw some angry <laughs> tweets about that. <laughs> Who gives a shit, really? Um, so did you yeah. pick this song just because so, of ass? Or what What went into picking this, I think, personally, very hot jam? I was, I was also sort of workshopping in my head if I could somehow say Scotseasonia. Scotseasonia. <laughs> okay, yeah. Is it Scotseason? Yeah. yeah, okay, yeah, yeah. And yeah. it's not, there's there's no ska relation to this song, but I just want everyone to know that it is very much ska season still, and by the end of this episode, you'll know why, and we're even after this episode recording a ska season exclusive. so um, it is ska season, 100%. Yeah, I mean, I, I think sort of right now we're in the eye of the ska, Gorm. I wasn't really sure how to do that. If you could figure that out, would be great. Because, you know, we've got Ska to our left. We've got Ska on our right here as we approach the end of this episode in the next two or three hours or what have you. And then, yes, the Ska <laughs> Lucy. So it is all happening. This song doesn't directly tie into it, except you could say Skasenia. Skasenia. Right. Okay. I mean, the episode will end basically as soon as you stop going off mic and ranting about... Um... What's going on? We've actually been recording for two hours. I keep having to say, okay, can we can we cut here? Can we cut here? Cut. I'm just saying, like how so Asthenia. This song bangs, but I think we have to address the dead air that also very unprofessionally begins this song. What's your take on yeah, that's true. Okay, well, to answer why I might have picked it, I found this while I was researching, and I think this might actually be why it was in my head, and I forgot. But somebody on on Reddit stupidly and foolishly uh, tied this song to Teenage Satellites because they both talk about Houston calling and uh, astronauts. So I think that's, again, just because there's um, really only so many lyrics that you can fit into these nursery rhyme-ass punk songs. But I did read that last week and forgot about it. And then I think maybe I was thinking about asthenia the whole time. <laughs> so it's just it's just been sort of deeply recessed in your mind as a result of thinking about forgotten astronauts in one of several large cities in America. Yeah, I think this is just a sign that there is a tumor made of Blink-182 Reddit posts <laughs> growing somewhere inside my body. Right. That I wasn't aware of. So that's comforting and encouraging. <laughs> yeah. Um, the dead air is absolutely a problem f for me as well. And I think that when the song finally starts, it is so, so good. This song comes. It, yeah, it, uh, it, it pools, I would say. And, <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, I, I respect that there's some irony in you and I discussing a need for brevity, which was uh, an excellent point made by a uh, friend of the pod, Sarah Murphy, uh, during Brevity Gate uh, earlier this week, which is that... <laughs> 
it's funny that brevity would affect us because as a pod, we are obviously not known for or particularly adept at it. But this song could use some brevity, right? I mean, it's yeah. just... It, when I put it on, I kind of forgot that this is how it started. And so I was Although, like, did I put I on will, the wrong track? And I was like scrubbing. And then it, I'm, all of a sudden I'm... 15 seconds into the song itself i'm disoriented Yo, hang on. you didn't listen to every second in preparation for this ad? no I, I put the song on loop <laughs> and i listened to it like 10 times before we started i was just sitting here having a pop just loving life trying but to calm down try, trying and failing to calm myself for our <laughs> intro in which i was uh, actually actually uh, laughing when i did listen to this song I did listen to it multiple times in a row because I think it's so good. It's, it's it's so good. It's so fucking good. But I just in wish... defense of the intro, I'll say that the, there's a the theme of the song is like proto angels and airwaves. It's like about a guy in space trying to decide if he should come back to Earth or not because Earth is so fucking fucked up <laughs> with like uh, you know all the all the problems that were on Earth. Mm-hmm. In the 2000s? That it yeah, of, kind of everyone knows solved. about, yeah, alt, alt, rate, alt rock radio not respecting, um, you know, people's intellectual property. <laughs> uh, you know, the problems right. of the world. <laughs> yeah, those problems. The stuff that but really I, so in, matters. <laughs> in that sense, I'll say the the sort of spacey thing, I guess, works in in the, like, very pretentious way of wanting to build a mood. Um, and another thing I'll say is that as somebody who like loved Godspeed You Black Emperor when I was little, um, <laughs> and and I've gone back to them a little bit here and there, and I've seen them live a couple times. Like they were like weirdly at the same time of me listening to Blink, I like got to uh, what's it called? I was gonna say take off your pants and jacket, <laughs> lift your skinny fists. <laughs> that one. <laughs> I mean, it's sort of there. I got take off your pants and jacket, where yeah. it's like not necessarily <laughs> their so best work in its entirety, but some of their most sort of exciting <laughs> and like Godspeed yeah. material. Like this, the material that defines yeah. the band is there. Yeah. But uh, but Godspeed broke up when I when I was like obsessed with them when I was younger, so I never got to see them. So I've gone to see them a few times while they've been on the same cash grab reunion tour as everyone else. And I, when I watch them, I've noticed there are long passages that are like eight minutes long where I'm like, this fucking sucks ass, this boring ass drone part. But then because of that boring part, the the like melodic happy good part is so much better because you've had to earn it. So I do feel like that's. As a deeply impatient person, I also think that sometimes those things that you have to earn exist for a reason. I, I want to agree with you, but I ultimately feel like Godspeed and the beginning of this song are just sort of <laughs> post-rock edging. Like, I've seen the videos, and I'm sure it feels really good, but I don't have the patience. And I'm kind of impressed that, that you do. Like, I just, I just want... A hundred choruses on top of each other, you know. Well, I'm definitely forever. like I think I'm more like that now, and I'm not saying that I necessarily enjoy it, but the payoff. I mean, I'm sure it's like edging too, right? Like the payoff is bigger if you can handle it. You can have the sting like <laughs> orgasm all over Shaggy's back, but otherwise, <laughs> it's like otherwise, it, you know, the rest of us just have to be satisfied with choruses all the time that are not necessarily explosive, but. <laughs> but still feel pretty damn good. Still feel really good. I mean, I respect what you're trying to do with a song like this. To me, especially with where the band was at at this time, it just feels like such an obvious attempt at creating a signpost that says that this band and this song is, is art now. Because you can put the long, droney art moment at the end of a song... And it's not quite as disruptive, but at the beginning of the song, you're really letting people know, like, what's up? This is what we're fucking about now. And, like, fuck yeah, you if you can't handle it. Yeah, and that's also a very um, U2 trick to do that. Like, they did that on, on a lot of, like, Joshua Tree songs and stuff. I think it is totally, like, a pretentious head-up-your-own-ass kind of move. And also... Um, I don't think the drone at the start is necessarily interesting enough. It kind of just sounds like synth presets, like just someone taped down a key. Well, yeah, that press play on some uh, some NASA YouTube videos. Well, that's what I was going to say. Like listening to it, I felt like I get it. It's it's you two. You're trying to do the you two thing, and it clearly sort of fits into where Tom was going with Angels and Airwaves. But the difference is those Joshua Tree moments are like fascinating moments of sonic experimentation. 
And because it's like Brian Eno doing it. Yeah, right? and exactly. So, yeah. And so they could get Robert Smith in on this record. Why not get like a cool drone guy to come in? Like, and that's the thing. Everyone should like if you're if you're in a pop punk band and you want to do a drone part, just like see if you can get someone from the cranky roster to do it. That would be so cool to get like <laughs> yeah. Bradford on like a good Charlotte song. This is my dream in life. Yeah, but instead you're sort of doing a pale imitation of it, and it's the one thing that I just feel doesn't ring true about this song because otherwise I think it it's like such a success of a song. I mean, it's so catchy and it sounds great and the arrangement and just like the structure of it is like, this is like a real perfect blink song from this era. And I just hate that I'm reminded of the kind of, I don't want to call it disingenuous because I've called a lot of things disingenuous and I don't think that's what this is, but like just maybe shallow place that that's coming from where it's like, you know, what's the Shakespeare signifying nothing and yada, 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 you know, Shakespeare. You talking, you talking the bard? Yeah. Talking bard, man. But, I hate when people called Shakespeare the bard. <laughs> who the fuck do you hang fuck, out with who calls fuck those people? No one calls Shakespeare so, the bard. Yeah, they do. Like, who are you hanging out with? Like, are you talking about Shakespeare a lot? Well, no, it's because, actually, this is something I was going to mention at the start. I used to work for this Alt Weekly, Fast Forward Weekly, and I feel like I can say this now, that the paper's gone. But, yeah, working there, people would, I would like, the arts editors would always be... Like, oh, let's write about local theater this week. Let's write about Shakespeare in the park. And then every headline would be like some play on the bard or whatever. <laughs> you know, it's like so embarrassing. But one time we hired an intern from the art college here. Um, and we just hired her and let her write shit because we like she was an art student, not a writer. She was an art student. Mm-hmm. And this wasn't in my sections. So so don't fucking blame me. But she literally just copied and pasted the full artist statement from the art show and (laughs) printed it. It was printed and distributed like 50,000 copies with her name on it. And there's like this huge uproar. And then she was like crying at our, she was crying in her office. And I I was just thinking like, like at what point do you learn that you shouldn't do do that? Like everyone knows that you don't just copy and paste things. You just change a couple words. At least. <laughs> yeah. Can I ask this though? How many, how many followers did the artist have? <laughs> yeah, that's true. I mean, uh, you can that, really get it. They probably weren't as popular as the paper. So that makes it allowed. So then you're allowed. Uh, you know, <laughs> I just want to read the full, quote from the bard that i was describing earlier of course this is one of uh his most famous soliloquies i don't know but i actually think now that it it maybe unlocks some of the keys to this song right because we're saying it's this kind of poor imitation of a u2 thing um uh, they use guitars for example so just keep that in your head (laughs) life's but a walking shadow a poor player that struts and frets his hour upon the stage and then is heard no more it is a tale Brett's told like, by an idiot, full of sound and fury, signifying nothing. Dude, that's hell yeah. that's that's Tom. I mean, it's rude about him, but look, Tom. It's also us. No, because we're strutting and fretting forever. But Tom, he strutted and fretted, <laughs> and then he was heard no more. I mean, except in all of his all of his other bands, but not in this band. Yeah. And some people <laughs> maybe thought Tom was an idiot. He's not. He's a genius. Um. <laughs> But maybe I can't this... remember how you even connected this to to my friend the bard uh, <laughs> to start talking about this, but I like it and I like fretted when you're talking about guitars, like as if he's like hitting those frets. Just just ba- just doing those hammer ons, man. It's classic Tom. <laughs> it's all. I'm just looking at where it is on the album too, and it's like, yeah. If with that dumb intro, it would work better if it was the last song. Maybe. Yeah. I just, I think you can get away with like a certain amount of like 10, 10 seconds would still give me that like, oh, when's this? Song? Oh, here it is. You know, but like it's a, yeah. it's a minute and who has time for that as we, you know, roll over in real time, at least the 37th minute of barely <laughs> talking about this song. <sighs> Yeah, this is a real interesting episode. I think so. Okay, it's so it's gonna get weirder. Is Do you want to talk about like what? Well, okay, actually, so we've we've just been ranting and raving about the intro, but the actual song itself, I think, didn't listen to the song when I. <laughs> fair, mm-hmm. fair. Uh, when it comes in, I feel like you. I think is what <laughs> I want to say. 
I feel so excited. I want to like call someone and tell them to listen to the song. <laughs> Just like hold it up to your speakers. <laughs> I want to like open up my big window of my loft and like yell out onto the streets. Like, yeah, it's so good. It's it makes me feel so good. It's funny. I, this song kind of has this weird, like, kind of like familiar but new effect because I honestly think that as a result of the long intro, I like skipped it a lot. And this is a record yeah, that I saw a lot of people saying that online. Yeah. And so when it started, I was like, oh, right, this song. Like, it had that effect on me where, like, I've heard it, you know probably hundreds of times, but as compared to the thousands of times I've listened to other songs, as compared to the, the tens of thousands of times I've probably listened to Down or All of This or other songs on this record, this one has this right. like weird effect where I almost still feel like I'm getting to experience it again for the first time, despite it sort of being... Um, and I think that's maybe the magic of the intro. Maybe that's why maybe, it's Maybe, yeah. I, I think the same thing happened to me where I remember when I had this CD... I would get the chorus stuck in my head and be like, oh, I need to hear that song. But then I could never find it because I couldn't figure out which song it was. And so I would like skip around all the time. Right. It's like kind of it's like a hidden track in almost the middle of the album. It's a hidden kind of track smart. inside of its own track. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh, but yeah, you're right. There's there's aspects of it that sound so new. The guitar playing is really cool and interesting and like. Everything sounds a little bit off, but also so poppy. And the weird guitar solo thing with like the chugging metalcore, it's like everything about this sounds so cool and so interesting. Well, this is, again, like outside of the intro, although now you're really selling me on maybe the intro being like secretly the best part of the song for kind of long term <laughs> viability, maybe like that. That's not of... the best part of the song, but it's like it protects the song. And yeah, same way that you uh, protect your emotions by pretending that you're not mad. It's like, <laughs> it's, a, exactly. it's like a buffer. <laughs> yeah. The intro is not mad. In fact, it's laughing. And so <laughs> the, the, the fact that that. Once you get through that level, that level of amber and that level of sort of uh, a, a forced smile uh, upon the stage, you end up with this song that is such a perfect distillation. And I, I think we've talked about this when we talked about other songs in this album, but like truly like the perfect distillation of what this band was doing at this time, where they were sort of cribbing from all of these places and really effectively synthesizing it. So the the song feels like it could have only been written by Tom and yet it doesn't sound like anything from the album previous. And it doesn't really sound like any of the other songs on this record. Like it kind of really effectively yeah, th- is on an island. But there's also an island guarded by an ocean of intro. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> the, intro, the intro rules. Let's be honest. Well, oh, you know what? Um, okay, people love people love superhero movies now. And I saw that, that movie Wonder Woman. And, you know, it's like there's an wow. island. Fem- Whoa. Are you a feminist? I am. I, I'm a proud feminist. I paid good money to see both <laughs> uh, Lady Ghostbusters and Wonder Woman. And that was my wow. activism for the year. What about uh, I Feel Pretty with Amy Schumer? Oh, I, I mean, I'm looking forward to seeing it. Is it out yet? I don't know. I don't know if that one's a, I don't think that one's good. I think people are, I don't think that's the right, right message. Right. And so I, bummed about it. and that's why I haven't seen it. So that's why you haven't seen yeah, it. Yeah. I've been avoiding it for Just political sure. purposes. No, 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 don't. I'm on the right side of everything all the time. I'm absolutely right. the protagonist in my own story. But yeah, Wonder <laughs> Woman's on an island that's like guarded by a wall of like U2 synths or whatever. So in a sense, the song is also like Wonder Woman, a reference that I'm not prepared to continue uh, past this point. Right, because I was going to ask you about your uh, position on Israel, but um, we can skip that. <laughs> Save that um, for the exclusive. That's the $100 exclusive <laughs> where we yeah. express our worst political uh, opinions. Um, What are we talking about? Oh, yeah. I think you're right, but I also think this song Internal has question, this Josiah. even more than like Down or some of the other ones that are very of this era. This song does have these like secret crazy pop hooks that – could make it like some people have said like i almost feel like this could have been on take off your pants like this song completely secretly has like big time pop going on as well played differently and that's what i think is so perfect about it but played differently this could have been like a second half of take off your pants song like i don't think it was ever going to be a single but it has i think in particular in the chorus if you played that chorus straight and then everything around it was kind of just chuggy normal pop punk pop muting 
it could totally be of that era. But instead, it's been like so effectively transplanted into what they were doing at this time. And it, I don't know if it feels similar to Down because they both have this sort of really open intro that's like kind of like a snare hit and then in and mostly kind of guitar noise and, and then bass. But I found on like the 10th loop through it just now before we started recording, I was like, is this song better than Down? A song that I, I think went it, hard for in the paint, you know, a thousand years ago when right. we talked about it. Yeah, I mean, it's almost like your opinions are are changing constantly. <laughs> yeah, uh. <laughs> yeah, it's almost like but, I, uh, yeah, I stand for absolutely nothing. <laughs> but the, I think this song is just so dense and so like classically a pop song, but then it's also so weird and it's them experimenting and it's very sad. It's just sad because this is like, I don't know, maybe, maybe we've said this before and I'm sure we'll say it again, but this seems like the logical end of what Blink-182 is capable of doing perfectly. Yeah, I, I, I totally agree. I, I think another thing that's sort of perfect about, where this song kind of sits, especially in retrospect, is it's unplaylistable. So this would have come out at a time where like iTunes was already dismantling the notion of an album. So you're hurting yourself to begin with in that sense, where it's just like not, this is not a song someone's going to pay 99 cents for after listening to the first 30 seconds of it. And today, right. every- that, I'm trying to think, is that really like, I, I think this era probably also would have been ringtones, maybe like two thousand three. I'm trying to think, was that was that iTunes preview time? Yeah, that must have been because, like, I mean, and now I'm gonna look it up, but we can't both be looking it up because someone has to vamp while we Google. <laughs> uh, maybe you can. I'm just, I'm, well, remember also when everyone was like, ringtones are gonna be the future. Yeah. Ringtones. And, <laughs> so this would have been a really bad ringtone with that uh, ambient start if only but, one of us um, had literally known this because it would have made it seem like geniuses the itunes store launched in april of 2003 and this song was released <laughs> really? in november 2003 so it is at the peak of of that happening to the music industry so it obviously wasn't built necessarily with that in mind because who would have thought that that was coming um, but at the same time obviously itunes sort of was stemming the the flow of users over to illegal fire file sharing sites. So that was kind of already happening. And then they go ahead and put together this like very strange, cohesive built to be listened to as a whole album. And then this song just kind of can't be divorced out of that context. Like I loved this and I'm never going to just put this on a playlist for when I'm walking around. I put like, you know, down on playlists all the time for just, you know, getting my life in the city. And this will never crack that. Cause I know that first minute's always going to make like my stroll weird. Yeah, but what if you're like, what if you put it on and that that intro comes on and you're just like, you start like seeing, you start looking around you and like seeing like, the billboards are just like fucking corporations <laughs> just like trying to get you. Right. And you look to the other side and there's like a, a junkie on the streets, and a rich man, um, <laughs> reaching down to his basket of coins and taking a coin out of it. Right. And you're like, God damn. If if I was listening to Harms right now, I would have never noticed all this all this fucked up shit that's going on around me. It's true. Thank Asth- you. Asthenia is like a Banksy <laughs> piece mixed with the glasses from May Live. <laughs> exactly. It has that effect for sure. Oh God. Well, also the song is about um, Mark and Tom breaking up. I didn't know if you knew that, but it, that's what it's about. Well, like okay. Every song. But does. Th- I don't know. Does this song maybe seem like it could be about that? Maybe I'm I'm just like being sucked in by the kind of redditness <laughs> of it all. <laughs> he well, misses him so much. I am sick of the boundaries. I miss you so much. You know what? I actually. Oh wait, this room is bored of rehearsal. You know what? The more I sort of read backwards through the lyrics, the more I sort of simultaneously uh, unconvinced and read backwards and like rearrange them and everything. Here's what Tom DeLong himself said. The song is about one thing only, an astronaut sitting in a space capsule (laughs) about the size of a car floating above the Earth. He's contemplating if even coming back or not will make a difference on such a negative place. A song about the loss of hope. A term was coined for the breakdown of life in space, and it's called Asthenia, the name of the track. I think the quotation mark ended somewhere in there. (laughs) These people doing notes. Again, everyone just needs to learn how to quote things better. Uh, Whether you're... (laughs) 
<laughs> but yeah, it, so Tom says this song is about one thing only. It's so he says it's literally about an astronaut trying to decide if he's going to come down from Earth. But I think that is also frustratingly reductive because that means he's saying there's no metaphor. He's saying it's like so, again like some Neil deGrasse Tyson shit. Like this, no, the song isn't about relationships. There's no other meaning whatsoever. It's about literally one astronaut in space. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think there's probably a word for this. And if you studied, you know, I don't know, philosophy in any serious way, maybe you know what it is. But at some point, you know, art doesn't just belong to artists anymore. And even if there is no intended other meaning, I think it's sort of generally accepted in academic circles to, you know, be able to. Uh, infer other things than, than maybe what was even originally intended. And I think it's not unreasonable to say, sure, Tom wrote this about an astronaut, but like it, it also functions as a fantastic metaphor for fascism and the rise of the state and obviously his relationship <laughs> with Mark, right? Yeah, I mean, like it's it would be stupid for him to say, yeah, it's about an astronaut in space. Like the reason that the story of an astronaut in space resonates with him is for like a long list of metaphorical emotional things. Yeah, that totally. Exist to him, and that's the reason other people like it too. You can't like it would be like saying this is about like or like when a grade eleven photography student takes a photo of a cobweb. They're not taking it because they like the cobweb. They're taking it because it makes them think about like how edgy everything is. <laughs> That's how they're trapped, Josiah. It makes them think about how they're trapped. Or they're going to trap yeah, exactly. someone. Yeah. there's. Oh, Tom, <laughs> love you. Yeah. You're so dumb. <laughs> whoa. Whoa. <laughs> so you remember how on the self-titled there was like um, all those behind-the-scenes vids where they're working on the songs and everything? Yeah, yeah. And then you can hear all the neighborhoods riffs in the background? Yeah, it, well, yeah, that that one part. But there's so there's a section where um, Tom is singing, singing the vocals on this. But I think they're different lyrics. I didn't actually double check, but it, it sounds like you have them open over there. So if they sound different, I don't know. But I also it made me realize like his vocals are also so good on this song. They're kind of perfect Tom. I think this is the perfect Tom era on this song. Yeah, I'm I, I I'm down. I agree. Okay, well, let's hear him in the stew. Last night it came as a picture Covered with oceans and glowing from inside This place was littered with evil If you could imagine you'd forget it if you tried Leave me a failed this effort I wrote a reminder Was uh, something I want to suck it up oh, And sick of the boundaries I miss you so bad Or much 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 should I come back? Should I come back? Should I? I feel alone and tired. Should I come back? Should I come back? Should I? This time I didn't want to. Should I come back? Look what God did. <laughs> yeah, those lyrics <sighs> are much worse. They are way worse. You know what it reminds me of? Like, you know, in the uh, Joe Strummer documentary, it, it literally opens with Joe Strummer in the booth doing the lyrics to, uh, or like doing the vocal take for White Riot. I was like, this is my White Riot. <laughs> hearing hearing Tom just, Dah! and it's great. I fucking love it. <laughs> but yeah, the lyrics, well, first of all, I don't really give a fuck about the clash. I've never seen the Joe Strummer doc. So all of the uh, fucking jean jacket guys who listen can get mad now and <laughs> and send me hate mail but yeah i don't really care about the clash but yeah it's weird to hear him be like shit i come back <laughs> so much worse i mean it would have just made it too literal i think he was looking ahead and saying at some point there's going to be this podcast uh that's going to get broadcast on this radio station and they're going to start developing truly <laughs> foolish slang i was just saying that things come and then they'll be like oh this song comes and then i'm going to say should yeah. i come back and, they, and they're going to circle the fucking drain of that for half an hour at least. So I'm just going to make that change and save everyone listening to this podcast, you know, uh, enough time to go maybe watch uh, uh, one of the new episodes of Arrested Development when they come out. Well, uh, I think it was actually Mark in the background who said um, to say go instead. He was like, should I say, or was that a different line? I don't know. Mark was giving lyrical suggestions to him. So. So Thanks, collaborative, Mark. those those two best friends. Uh, I haven't really paid attention to Blink-182 since 2003, but I can tell that those guys are the best of friends <laughs> and still just close 
<laughs> yeah, it's. I mean, this is a, a podcast dedicated to modeling our friendship after their friendship, and so far, <laughs> right. smooth sailing. Very excited to I'm see where we're peeling the layers one, one at a time, uh, one yeah, layer at a time. Exactly. Um, okay. There's no music video for this song, but you know YouTube. You know YouTube. YouTube. Uh, YouTube. dot com. Yeah. Yeah. Um, no, I am. Um... What's the What's the deal? Here's a real question. What's the deal with like? Uh, hey, what's the deal with airline food? Just kidding. Um, what's Good the one. deal with when you play like a copyrighted song on YouTube and then does the band just get all the money and they don't even get to have a say in it though? Well, it's like a... if you if you put a song in a video and then it says like music by in the like YouTube ads who the music's by, they're just getting all the ad revenue for that. Is that how it works? Yeah, so Content ID um, works however a publisher wants it to work. So certain publishers have set it to, and and individual artists have just set it to automatically take down any unauthorized use of a song. Others have just said, uh, take the ads off, and others have said, run ads, and they recoup the revenue. So if you upload a skateboarding video that has uh, Asthenia in it, I don't really know what Blink's sort of policy is on YouTube or what their publisher's policy is, but... Uh, that well, would... it seems like there's not really that many ads, so maybe they just don't care because it does seem like they're pretty open to like uh, to that kind of thing. Well, it's sort of interesting. So, I don't know. Yeah, there's some stuff where – well, they definitely are because – we'll get to this at some point. But there was a song where they made a video of all like illegal uses of their song, right, on like skate videos and shit. I think that was, I think that was edited out of the Up All Night episode, <laughs> and so you could get it on the Patreon thing. Oh, great. Oh, there we go. Another reason to support us on Patreon. <laughs> What a yeah, exactly. What a great throwback there. There's a lot of great content for you to <laughs> dig into. There's the Up All Night exclusive. There's the Merch Pundit. There's Josiah's Brothers anti-masturbatory glass glove. <laughs> oh, yeah, that's classic. That's my favorite. Um, Someone was recently saying that they finally donated to the Patreon, and, and they were sort of like not stoked on at least the titles of the episodes. They were like, none of this is really interesting to me. I'm just telling you, if you... Are, if you at all enjoy this podcast, like if you are into hour two or whatever with us on this right now, like those, some of those exclusives are, uh, in my opinion, our best content. So, especially the one we're going to record after this. Yeah, exactly. Um, exactly. I have that sense. <laughs> but what I was going to say was there's, there's no music video for this song, but there is like an unofficial music video that's just cut up footage of Blink 182 that almost looks like they're playing it. And it has like 20 million views. And I just, <laughs> It, but it also seems like they're not running ads in front of anything. So I don't know how they're getting money for it or what. Weird. Like it's like almost synced. I was recently uh, watching the Bare Naked Ladies video for um, what it's like a late era song that I'm not super familiar with. But the entire video is all of the other Bare Naked Ladies videos sort of uh, animated to look like they're singing and playing this new song. So it's like Enid and fucking One Week and all the hits. <laughs> Old Apartment. <laughs> And so this Just sounds get it like all that. At once. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, it's all like hyper, the BNL like, content. It's, it's hyper concentrated. <laughs> yeah, exactly. The fentanyl of bare naked ladies. BNL compilation. I love it. So there's this one that's getting 20 million fucking hits, and it it sucks. But then I found this other one that uh, only has 365 views. So maybe someone's been watching it every day for a year. Just a little uh, number reference there for you. <laughs> <laughs> that's good, man. That's for that's for all the number heads out there. <laughs> yeah, exactly. But this one is just so good. It's so uploaded by Matt Martin. Um, actually, uploaded in 2007. Simple music video for Asthenia by Blink 182. Nothing crazy, but it works. So uh, we we guess it's, like it's the studio version of the song, but it, it opens with zooming in on space, and then it's just this boy wearing like what? two, I believe, two clover things. Like his hat has a clover and his shirt. Yeah. And then the boy changes he changes outfits and he has to be some sort of government guy. Oh my god, it's so out of focus, but eventually it goes into focus. Well yeah, it's clearly sort of Is filming it? it himself and the autofocus is taking some time. So so uh <laughs> d- did we say cuz we got to make sure we credit uh so this is Matt Martin. Matt, Matt Martin. <laughs> and he's just really like <laughs> So it's it's mostly him. So yeah, he's like the most like you know I love St. Patty's Day kind of college guy off the off the start, and then he sort of transitions into being behind a podium with like an oversized sort of generic military jacket, and he has a friend with him who's sort of in what who's looks 
he's a shepherd, I think. Like, so yeah. he'll show you, like, the government is... Contr- or maybe he's not a shepherd. I think he's, like, a, he like a religious... I, I'm seeing it as, like, a sort of spiritual garb. And then he's sort of using the, the uh, crook of his uh, staff to kind of like bat at the guy's head like it's a like it's a pool ball. I I we have just <laughs> Oh my god, we've uploaded my, this video. Favorite... Right? This is on you've shared yeah, this I'll, on I'll YouTube. I'll tell you right what now, we're right? doing with this video first, but but I just want to say that I love the way that he's simultaneously non-committal and awkward like an adolescent boy but also trying to emote so hard while he lip syncs. Like it's the perfect tension of trying to be emotive but also being very uncomfortable yeah totally like yeah he wants to come in he just can't do it the main reason that we need the nation to see this is because we haven't even mentioned the entire thing is shot in front of a green screen yeah so there's i mean someone could easily turn this into a much much better music video yeah so i mean there's got to be amongst our 600 listeners like one (laughs) that is good at green screen chroma keying i don't know like it's like wife of the pod your wife of the pod like makes video for a living right she's a director she can do this yeah. right yeah she yeah she might know how to do this i mean she's probably busy doing real things but we could try <laughs> sorry did we always, diminish her someone. job there <laughs> she's got time well, right there is, I, there is a thing that I've been working on with another filmmaker friend that he he created something for this video that I'm gonna put on our socials soon. That's like, oh, is that gonna be part of this? A lot of time. No, oh, it could be, it could be. <laughs> so we'll see. All I'm saying is there's green screen on here. As always, please stop DMing me. I will link you all of the videos on our Twitter, so you'll see this and you'll you get to experience Matt Martin and imagine what you want to put in the green screen and then just figure out how to do it. Just use a YouTube tutorial. There's got to be like a just green screen iMovie effect that makes this so easy. So I would I would love to see what people can do with this. It's it just feels like <laughs> so. I mean, it's it's like the what's his name? Like just do it. Yeah, that that guy Shia LaBeouf, right? Uh, like he's just oh yeah this man is just I was, feeding I was us thinking content of, um i was thinking of the water boy uh rob schneider you can do it oh <laughs> <laughs> which is also what you could do yeah totally yeah maybe this episode is horrible what i talk i think i'm really saying dumb things no really, uh... this is a good episode josiah <laughs> and it's good because well, let me make it a there's no chance that our guest has brought in like potentially new listeners that have just been sort of baffled while trying to find the one thing they care about. <laughs> yeah, I hope he tells them to use the time code. <laughs> yeah, please if you're just just look at the time code, it's in the description. But then they'd miss out on stuff like this, Sam. Um, you were knocking the intro earlier, but without the intro, you wouldn't have this 19-second video called Blue Shoes uploaded by Sam Neat in 2009. Uh, which is, as described, uh, the intro with just um, three or four images animated of his absolutely disgusting blue shoes. <laughs> yep, that's <laughs> all mean, this that is, is, man. That's all this is. <laughs> what, <sighs> what, are, what were you searching? Like, I... Were you searching? Cause he mentions is... Asthenia in the description. I oh, think okay. I just no on YouTube. I searched Blink Asthenia on SoundCloud. I searched uh, just the word Asthenia. Okay. Alone. Uh, so, um, yeah, it's been really, uh, it's been really a deep dive into uh, Asthenia. There's a lot of deviant art users named Asthenia, but once again, they just draw like anthropomorphic fuckable dragons. So I don't know <laughs> if that's really it's send, for a different pod. Send me the dragon you want to fuck the most, Josiah. <laughs> Hey, dare I say, imagine dragons. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, there's there's a lot of covers, unfortunately, or fortunately. I, dude, I'm I'm, I'm ready to the world. I'm ready to hear this song. Now, I wasn't gonna play this one, but I just want you to read. I wasn't. The, the share, the way it was shared on Reddit was just made. It made me so happy because it's so sincere. We may as well play it, I guess. It's like it's pretty unremarkable, but someone said on Reddit, I yes. put this together with user condom man one eighty two. It's just like this sincere post about how great condom username condom man one eighty two yeah uh, did his drumming. So 
I guess we may as well quickly play a little bit. Yeah, I want to. I want to hear how yeah. Condom Man uh, 182 is on the on the skins. You know. So and I guess since we're all about crediting, it's also Taylor. So just the name Taylor. Like imagine how you could find that. You can. Uh, it's also important to use a name that's searchable. <laughs> Yeah. Condom Man 182, you'll find. Taylor, I don't know if you're going to find Taylor on YouTube. Or, I mean, SoundCloud, but maybe you can. Well, let's, we know. found let's him. Let's, let's let everyone else find him now. The thing about the drummer Condom Man 182 is that he loves skins. <laughs> It's like so straightforward, but shout out to Condom Man 182. Hell yeah, <laughs> this, uh, skins really... joke. That was good. That was good. I let. I, I just. I already like. You know, we've done. This is our 44th episode, and I love sort of getting a general sense of kind of where the episode is going to go. When you when you start by telling me there's a lot of covers. <laughs> And then you go, the first one I'm not going to play, but I just want you to look at it, which inevitably ends up with you playing it. Well, I mean, what else? I don't know. I have another one like that, too, that I don't th really think is worth playing, but it's worth seeing this top comment because this little boy did a, cover, a drum cover of it for his high school talent show, um, and he has a mohawk. It's for Jackson's Got Talent. His name is Jason McCombs, and it was uploaded uh, in 2012. Um, this kid is so small at, He's so tiny And he drums like pretty good It's like unremarkable But I just want you to look at the comment from Steve-O Sonderin um, Because this boy is so young Like I would say probably nine And then Steve-O Sonderin what did, what did he say, Sam? Steven Sonderin said <laughs> 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 okay, I, I want to emphasize once again, this kid is tiny with a mohawk. He's just a sweet little kid just playing in a gymnasium. Just a babe. Just a, like in, not in the sexualized <laughs> sense, but a true babe like a young lad. And just a <laughs> Steve O'Sonderin watches this video, cracks his knuckles, and writes, I hope you get so much pussy, man. I really do. <laughs> <laughs> and then Spitfire MLG replied one month ago. So he revisited this video. He wrote, he definitely did, LOL. <laughs> what the fuck? <laughs> That's insane. Wow. But the rest of the comments are very innocent because Jason McCombs is just very thankful. And he talks about how everyone was clapping and dancing and standing up and cheering. I nailed it. Thanks again for the support. Good work, Jason. Mm. I hope that you got validation from that and nothing else because you're so young. <laughs> yeah. That's the same. That's all I want for him is the, the, the satisfaction of doing something well. So there's a lot of acoustic covers. They're mostly awful. Um, this one I was kind of into a little bit. Okay. Uh, this is Sincerely Andrew, and it's an, an acoustic cover featuring the plus one on violin. Now, they look like they're in – not that I see churches everywhere, but this looks very churchy to me. Okay. Um, this setup. Or maybe maybe a community center, maybe a school, but it's it's something. But he's just on a stool. He's wearing flip-flops. They're both dressed very, like, plant, like, no like I feel like these people are actively trying to look normal. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah. Just, that's just my description, I guess. So it's this guy um, and his yeah. sauce on the violin. Yeah, exactly. Okay. So here we go. Last night came as a picture with a good reason. This place is void of all passion. If you can imagine, it's easy if you try. Believe me, I failed this effort. This was a reminder. This wasn't a vision. This time, where are you, Houston? Is somebody out there? Will somebody listen? I mean, it's so like a campfire, but the the violin I thought was a nice touch. The violin's a really nice touch. I mean, I, I think you know I, I've sent you uh, occasional kind of uh, messages about this, and, and I've tweeted about it before. Like, especially when I'm working, I really love to just 
put on, like, I have whole playlists that are just, like, the string tribute to Green Day and the piano tribute to The <laughs> Offspring. Um, like, it's not ironic to me. It's fully a thing that helps me, like, focus. And so uh-huh. I I love hearing a thing I know on a violin. I just think, ooh, time for me to, to really buckle down and get some work done. So, Oh, God. Well, um, that's good for you, I guess. Thanks. Yeah, I don't know. I'm happy that you're. Um, what about that was so exasperating life? for you? <laughs> I don't know. I just didn't know what to say. I just uh, pretend to get mad when I don't know what to say. Mm. It's just one of my ticks. It's <laughs> good. I've written down so many things I can't remember uh, what to do next. Okay. Well, like, let me see. Read me one of the names. Okay. No, I'm just gonna play you the so. So there's lots of drum covers, you know, like lo- lots of uh, drum covers on YouTube. And often the, <laughs> it sounds like the beginning of a comedy bit. Lots of uh, like <laughs> it's like a Norm Macdonald thing. Lots of uh, <laughs> drum covers. Yeah, uh, yeah drum well, covers so you see on this, YouTube. <laughs> you see that it says real drum cover. You're like, okay, yeah, he's not using like <laughs> triggers or anything. You know, it's real drums. Turns out it's an app called Real Drum, and this is like the tech decks of drum covers. So this is wow. just like someone's nasty ass cuticles um, <laughs> blasting through this this uh, smartphone. The 33 views. Um, let's hear. So this was <laughs> this is the user. It's important to credit everyone, no matter what. This is the user two four space seven. Good. Um, so look for two four seven with their Real Drum cover. 33 views. Um, <laughs> That app looks kind of fun, actually. Uh, There are real drum covers on YouTube that have millions of views. There is a real. Is that how they do it? Like they they just film instead of doing a screen cap? Do they film their nasty ass fingers? Yeah, like smudges of their phone. I'm sending you like a video that starts insanely blurry. It looks like someone's playing it on like a flip phone, (laughs) and it's got almost (laughs) seven million views, and it's a cover of Nothing Else Matters. So it's like. So once again, this is the song is being obscured by this shitty app. So then does that mean Metallica doesn't get money from those 7 million plays? Oh, no. Content ID knows, man. Content ID, ID hears everything. <laughs> it knows when you're humming it at home. Exactly. Alone. It's it's always listening, okay, let's, man. <laughs> 7 million. We got to hear a bit of this. This is Yazi Black. <laughs> Y-O-Z-Z-E-B-L-A-C-K. I guess the worst thing to come up with this Indie 88 thing is I'm always going to read every username every time, no matter what, for I the think, rest of my life. I think you always did, but maybe I'm really uh, like sort of retroactively deciding that we're better people than we truly ever were. But we can, it's, this is what a teachable moment is, right? Like, you know, when like one person does something racist and then they call it a teachable moment, like everyone's supposed to learn. I don't, I don't think, I don't think the lesson of a teachable moment is ever supposed to be. I've always been great and I have nothing I need to work on. (laughs) No, no, but okay. But that's, that's what I'm saying is this is a teachable moment for us as well. I'm trying to actually be taught. Right. By, okay. Well. Well, then let's listen to Yazi Black's take on uh, Lars's part on Nothing Else Matters. Well, there's a pretty long intro to this song, I think. There's no drums at the start, and he was just like changing the setting. <laughs> I think that's all I need to see from that video. You change the settings of the. That's it. You I, get... Get, I get where he was going with it. Yeah, that's the point. Um, <laughs> all right, uh, let me see here. Um, some guy. Well, we're sort of in the novelty section. This guy. This guy uploaded it with an LOL, so I think he's in on the joke that he's created here. Okay. So it's Maddie Maddie Moon King on SoundCloud. Maddie Moon King, uh, Asthenia Harmony's LOL. So this is just for you, the the Harms boy. Hell yes. So. <laughs> Somebody else. 
I think that was one of those defensive LOLs where he actually was stoked about how he nailed those harms, but then he he knew that it would be open to criticism, so he wrote LOL. I know. I feel bad about that. Uh, you know, not my harms, but, you know, fill, <laughs> fill your boots, man. Fill your boots. <laughs> oh, man. What does that mean, fill your boots? I don't know. Like p- someone around me started saying it a lot. Fill fill your boots etymology. Um, like most things, uh, oh, I don't know. Uh, fill your. I'm I'm just reading a word detective uh, blog post right now, which is certainly not how well, we should be spending I our mean, time. Most uh, most most language comes from the bard. I think most of our modern. <laughs> it's speech, it's speech true. Russian, so we just we can always credit the bard. Was. Um, that was a little hard for me to tell because we're we're doing this where like I, I've called you through Skype to your phone. It's a little distorted through the speakers. The way it sounds to me is kind of like the harmonies are like an auto generated harmony, or is that definitely him singing like all of those harmonies? No, it's like that was that was kind of also why it was disarming or disarming, if you will. Mm, um, and I always will. It's because he, I think he was doing the harmonies almost too well and doing too many of them where it just it sounded auto generated and there was some falsetto going on. I mean, that's why he insecurely put that LOL, but I think you got to really embrace your harms. If you're going to, if you're going to put that kind of shit out there. Yeah. True. I mean, look at my recommendation, you know, from one harmon to another is <laughs> like the song Asthenia. Sometimes a little restraint leads to a bigger reward. You want to edge with your harms and only then can your harms truly come. <laughs> oh, there it is. So thank you to all of Imagine Dragons fan base for listening so far. This You're getting a real feel for what we're like. And this is why we feel sorry for ourselves when people don't give us credit. Yeah, who would because want to we're so. Us? T- <laughs> all right, let's move along. Mike Gent, G-H-E-N-T. This is for something called Unsigned Does, some sort of. I don't know. Everyone always had some sort of fucking YouTube thing for like up and coming artists. Like, you know what I mean? Like, yeah, totally. So, so this whatever. is unsigned like, does what, at what point did, junior battles unsigned does prenup. Like, is that how it would be conjugated for the well, title? Of the this episode? one is unsigned does blink 182. And then Mike Gent uh, pops by. Oh, but it's like okay. whenever, whenever people conceive of these things, who do they picture is going to be watching all this shit other than the person's family? You know what I mean? Like, does anyone actually like I'm really into like unsigned band sessions on YouTube. Like I love to just like search the word unsigned and session and just like <laughs> spend an afternoon. <laughs> yeah. That's my favorite content. Uh, I think that That's my favorite genre. You no, know, the unsigned. worst thing that happened to the internet and to like video on music websites like music news or whatever websites is the idea that sessions were remotely interesting and there are exceptions right. and the problem is those exceptions spurred everyone to do their own thing so like you know blog tech takeaway shows were like really fucking wonderful when they started and like exciting and and occasionally like too pretentious by half but like a just a super innovative idea and beautifully shot right and then everyone had people should have been like people should have been like oh the idea of that is they're doing something creative with music i should do something creative (laughs) also instead of I should also film my friends playing a banjo in an elevator. Yeah, exactly. And so everyone has, there was like the black cab sessions. And uh, I think like literally Indy 88 is like the black room sessions. And like everyone has like their, and occasionally you'll kind of catch lightning in a bottle again. Like the tiny desk concert that NPR does is legitimately great. Although even today I was talking to someone about it and they were like, people only think it's great because of the one T-Pain session, which is probably true. <laughs> Where everyone was like, That's yo, T-Pain can everything. sing. Yeah. You just need one. You just need one Imagine Dragons episode oh. to really make your brand. That's it. So I think – anyways, uh, so let's let's help out Mike Gent and give him another play on his fucking session here. Okay. Um, so here's his take on Asthenia. Easy. 
know. The, <laughs> you know what? There are parts of that I'm 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 there for. It, it's it's got like a little bit of an Elliot vibe to it in terms of like an era oh, of emo. Oh yeah, I hated that shit. Oh, see, I loved. I mean, I love Elliot. Like my love is active. I was I put on Calm Americans like on the weekend. S- still a band uh, whose music. Yikes. Yeah, I think uh, <laughs> fully fully banks fucks and comes, but like. <laughs> oh, God. Buddy from Elliot never did that like American Idol vampy shit that just like destroyed yeah, the music trills and stuff. Uh, like that it just it's just not necessary. And I would say if you took that production and put like like a real sort of like uh, like a, a female voice with some character, I would be like, send me the link, Josiah. I'm gonna buy that song on Bandcamp, and it'd be like the yeah, the cousin Dangeru this- of this pod for me. But I'm not there. I don't really like um, I I don't really like when people are good at singing as we've established so that's already a no for me dog but also uh, I think this music sounds like someone who does truly think that they're gonna get signed like it's like this music just yes. sounds like it's someone trying to get signed yeah totally line. so uh, pretty depressing let's just move along how about mm, um, fine with me. This one is like this is more in my zone because it's very ramshackle and kind of more falling apart. So this person, uh, they've uploaded an instrumental version. The username is Nico Cass. There's an umlaut over the A. Okay. Um, this is 2014. Less than 400 views. Asthenia acoustic cover instrumental that was really challenging for some reason. And so you'll hear why they found it challenging. But that's what I love about it. It's so weird. love it because it shows how hypnotic the song is that it you'd think that a straightforward acoustic cover would be easy but the timing gets all weird and it almost sounds like it's gonna fall apart all the time yeah i found that like really compelling and i, exactly. I guess that's why I, I'm, I'm kind of like perplexed i have a hard time sort of putting it um uh like uh, putting it properly like, I, but I legitimately just There's, found myself like I wasn't. And that's why I'm like I'm kind of like surprised that it's over. Like I've I've come out of some deep rivery. Like <laughs> that, was, that was wonderful. Yeah, I think there's something about this song that is very magical about the timing of the riffs and everything that it makes you feel uh, hypnotized by it. And oh. and that's why this person tried to do an instrumental cover and accidentally unlocked a secret portal. Yeah, it, it's also just a reminder of there are times when we record this podcast when, you know, you've described each episode of the pod as you kind of saying goodbye to a Blink song that you can never yeah. return to again. And I occasionally have experiences where, especially with songs like this that I love, but I haven't run into the ground yet. And like, there's not a ton of Blink songs that I love that I haven't run into the ground that I know that this is going to be like a thing that I listen to every day for like several weeks. <laughs> And that was yeah. that was the moment where I was like, oh, fuck me. I'm going to this is you know, I did it with dogs eating dogs like dogs eating dogs was on every playlist that I made for myself for like a month. So I love oh, it. so good. Yeah, so man. Good. Um, OK, I've got I've still got three more. That's fine. I saw one in the sidebar as I was like watching that video, which is just like it's a lake. There's nothing there. But like, I, I feel like. I've done that thing where you like catch a yeah, glimpse I've, of a I've, present as should... a kid. And you're like, <laughs> I was like, <gasps> and, and I, I, there's no way that you're not going to play you should it. Write, you should write down what it is in case, uh, in case I don't have it, but I've got the um, window open, to... but I'm just, I'm so excited. So it's, it's fine. Let's, okay. Let's get well, these last three to start off, to start off, we're going to play. Now there is a genre of uh, super cuts and fail videos of the worst teen bands. And people think that it's really mean, 
Um, but I love it, and I think it's so genuinely wonderful when a horrible teen band is on the internet. And We the Antidote, um, I don't think they've quite gone viral because they have only 1,100 views over the last 10 years since this was uploaded. Um, but this is them like getting excited for their big show, sharing rehearsal footage. So they were going to play at Fab's Party Hall. Um, I heard great things about course. Fab's Party Hall. <laughs> yeah, it's one of the top venues uh, wherever We the Antidote uh, happens to reside. Um, th- they they apologize for the sound quality, which I think might be the biggest problem here. Um, let's, let's hear uh, We the Antidote performing Asthenia. <laughs> It sounded like Captain Beefheart or the Shags. Yeah, I mean, I think if the sound quality was a little better, that would have been great. That's that's I can see why they wanted to get it in front of that uh, possible critique. Yeah, you know, something that you know you and I could see, but that no one listening, you know, would be able to to see because it's a podcast. Is the the drummer was actually the one singing there, and so I do respect them sort of seeking to follow, you know, in the model of such great uh, drummer singer bands as. Um, Sloan. Three Doors Down. <laughs> yeah. Three Doors Down. Two, yeah. of the, two of the greats. Don Henley, right? Um, the Eagles. Uh, Don Henley sang and he played drums, right? I want to say that uh, the guy who hits a floor tom in my friend's band, Imagine Dragons, also occasionally sings too, or might even be the singer. I need to revisit. I, I You'll you'll hear. I've promised that I'm going to check them out and okay. give them a fair shake. <laughs> okay. But yeah, I love, I honestly would love to see this band. Um, I think that it's not I actually don't think it's mean to make fun of teens for sucking at music because it's just a moment in time and they're either going to get better at it or decide that they don't care. So I think it's perfectly fine to laugh at teens who suck at music. Well, look, and and I've said this before, and I think it's because I consistently feel the need to defend what I what I am concerned is not a fully tenable position. But like we have roasted some bad covers on this pod and there has not been a time where someone has heard through the grapevine or heard somehow because they are one of our 600 listeners that they got roasted and not been like, Oh shit, you're right. Like I was 16 and that band was terrible. And it was fun to hear you guys like, you know, giving a yeah. shit for being inspired by, um, you know, uh, so if you, three doors if down. you know, uh, if you know, we, the antidote or you were at fabs party hall for that show, please get in touch because we'd love to, uh, I would think it would be cool actually to do like exclusive where we talk to some of the bands we roasted on here. That's so actually if, a great idea. If you've talked to us before, because a few, quite a few people have contacted us. So if you want to talk behind the paywall, unfortunately, you're not, you're not, you're no uh, Dan Reynolds. But um, if you want to talk about it, please get in touch because we could. That would be fun. I that think would that would be fun. super fun for sure. And they okay, can give Sam. it to us. We can get them to review some some junior battles and some prenup. <laughs> oh yeah, that would be cool. Okay, <laughs> that's, or like our old bands. Like I could send them. My oh old, yeah, old that yeah yeah Screamo that's what that's what would be fair. It's not sending them like the things that are like you know, super good. Um. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, so, Sam, I want you to read, because in addition to being Ska season, there's another season. I want you to read the title <gasps> yes! of the video for oh, all of us, Oh, my God. Yes. Okay, so for people who aren't, maybe you're a newcomer to the pod, um, you know, welcome uh, Imagine Dragons fans one and all. Uh, it has been we've sort of been living inside of kind of two seasons, like how it can be like summer and also hurricane season. So right. uh, obviously we've addressed ska season, but uh, something else that's been happening kind of a qu- quieter and in the background has been Indonesian season. And you just sent me a video called cool period space. Cool. An Indonesian that's all caps plays Asthenia blink 182. Awesome. Three exclamation points. <laughs> yeah. And this has been uploaded yeah. by Edwin Ordo Adderwins and, like we have like accidentally discovered this this 
for us, like not that we didn't discover it. This is like some Chris Columbus no. shit. We didn't discover it. <laughs> we personally have been uh, introduced to enamored, yeah, and I mean, enamored I'm blown of away. this. Yeah, this fucking Indonesian it seems pop like punk 90, renaissance in, in Indonesia right now. It's '90s pop punk. It seems like it's and uh, actually MXPX memes shared a thing. So if you're <laughs> if you're an Imagine Dragons fan who's listening. Uh, there was this Christian pop punk band called MXPX who has a meme account dedicated to him who is also obsessed with us, the meme guy. So uh, that's sort of the framework we're Ugh. speaking within right now. Yes. Um, but yeah, he sent me this thing that this Indonesian pop punk band like perfectly recreated an MXPX promo shot from the 90s. Amazing. Like, it's, it's, it's lit exactly the same. Like, yeah. Oh, my God. So, so. Do you want to hear this this guy? I uh, do, yeah. Edward? But I think, like, again, if you're if, if for some reason this is your first episode, like, honestly, there are like a treasure trove of insanely good Indonesian bands. Some of them are like super lo-fi. Like, there was something a couple of weeks ago that was literally kids playing electric instruments not plugged in, but you could still like the song definitely you could tell ripped. that it was an amazing song. Yeah, yeah. totally. So, uh, yeah, oh. I'm, I'm super excited for this. Okay, here we go. It's magical. It's so good. I, when when people play lo-fi uh, pop punk hits like this and there's like a TV in the background, it's just – it's so real and good and amazing and I love it. Yeah, it's just so perfectly sincere and I don't know. I just think it like – yeah. I, I, I mean that is like – it's know the strooms. I love. I like. I've had a, a hard time. I think displacing maybe the strooms in my Indonesian pop punk heart. But like, this is like absolutely what I love about these songs that we've sort of played from that region, where like it just like does scrappy right, and like it's yeah, so totally. fun. Yeah. Well, Sam, uh, before I get to the final cover, I want to show you there is also a band called. Asthenia. Mm, okay, a trick um, ending. I see. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> and this band called Asthenia. I don't know if you can see on their SoundCloud uh, where they're from or not. Uh, uh, I, I, the... Oh, another Indonesian band. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and look at their logo. I can never like stay a... mad at you. Oh, this logo <laughs> is s- like so 90s. Like we joked. And it about... says Indonesian pop band in the corner of that logo. Oh, does it? Oh my god! Okay, so this logo is like that. It's like the not the varsity font. I guess that's like a varsity font or whatever. It's well, it's like baseball, very baseball. Yeah, me. yeah, yeah, yeah. Like uh, baseball kind of font, and then it's superimposed. So Asthenia is superimposed on this like super cartoony, like I don't know, uh, crazy. Like I can't tell if it's a monster or whatever on a rocket. Like it's the most like we joked about like baseball ringer <laughs> tee, like s- sexy female alien on a rocket. Like we literally were joking about this last week. Like. Like this is like aesthetically is such it. a perfect distillation of this moment. Okay, I oh I hope it's good. So uh, Josiah, this is, is it well, good? okay. They have they have a bunch of songs, but I decided I'd play you the intro because they literally introduced themselves. Yes. So, um, okay. It's gonna it, it it'll take a little second to kick, to kick in, but it's worth it. Here okay. we go with the band Asthenia from Jakarta, Indonesia. We are Asthenia.
<laughs> it did not go where like it or it started off weird and we were in some uncertain territory and then you know back on they solid were, ground they were, pull, they were pulling a fast one on us all yeah that was sneaky it was like yeah just like some yeah, reggie in the full effect shit like i oh god damn it went, it, but then it went where we needed it to go did it not it I absolutely mean, did is there like you know, look, I know that th- there are like podcast festivals all around the world now. And, you know, you can go and hear one of like 1,000 like sexy murder Blink podcasts. podcasts. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. And I get that like we will never be invited to one of those even or in, in particular any that happen in any of our hometowns. But <laughs> there has got to be like early on we discovered that we had started this podcast sort of just after a Blink-182 Fest or something in Amsterdam, which like I like right. to think if that were to happen around now, we would find, find a way there. Like if there is like what's the Indonesian Fest like what's the thing that all the yeah. people with stress is there face like tattoos a warp tour going on? Yeah, like there's yeah. got to be something because there's clearly a scene, and I'm just saying like please. Invite Josiah and I, uh, pay for our flights, um, pay, yeah. pay for our, our, our lodging and, um, and maybe our food. And we would love to come. I would just, I just want Plus nothing per more. Diem. Yeah. I'd like a per diem. Obviously well. I need a healthy per diem. Um, and I only fly first class on flights that are over four hours. So like, it's a thing, but look, we'll figure it out. We will figure it out. I just like. Uh, you know, I've been astounded by the places that this podcast has taken us. I mean, I mean, very genuinely. Um, Virtually, you mean, but we got to get some IR real play, IRL exactly. places. Exactly. Uh, yeah, it, it's only taken us places in our hearts, and I want to go somewhere with my body. So, please <laughs> Ooh, take my. <laughs> I thought you'd never ask. <laughs> please take my body to Indonesia. So, so the final cover I'm hoping is. Uh, the same one that I had planned for last. Well, I assume it wasn't uh, the Indonesian bedroom boy. No, I, I, did, I, mean, I didn't find an Indonesian bedroom boy. But what I found it, and it's a, yeah, this is it. Okay, so <laughs> okay, good. This is like the most Josiah, but I like to think also Sam, uh, at least aesthetic. Uh, it's deeply popular. Like, look at the play count. I know. This is more popular um, than the podcast. Like, this is one of those examples of, see, they could come at us for uh, for copyright right. infringement because that's how this works. Exactly. So, and I, I was trying to figure out exactly what it was. And let me see where I found, because the write-up is very odd. So, we're talking here about a band called Scratch 21. Mm-hmm. Which looks um, to be, like, the, a fairly popular kind of YouTube outfit. They've got 27... Uh, thousand subscribers on YouTube. So I found this website with an about page. Um, Scratch 21 is basically like a pop punk version of gorillas or something, but for the anthropomorphic furry set, um, they don't seem particularly sexualized completely, but they do have sort of like the furry aesthetic that normally you see on like furry blogs and stuff. Um, this is Phoebe Warries based in the UK she has created them and drawn them and everything and they have what their song sorry jack has over 2 million views so like they're pretty popular um animatron animated pop punk band but i noticed on the description on youtube it says that they're a pop punk activist music collective i'm so perplexed by the oh, activism wow. portion of it i mean <laughs> i feel I, look at maybe they do like real activism so I, I just want to make that very clear. Could could be wrong. Happy to issue a correction. But I kind of feel like sometimes with these people, the activism <laughs> has has <laughs> has much more to do with like the the sort of uh, like pushing for their perceived civil rights as like uh, like a uh, some sort of uh, I- identity minority like that. People right. don't take pop punk furries seriously or they think it's all sexual and they're like, no, sometimes it's just about skateboarding and having fun with your best bunnies. Or, or maybe they're a furry animated pop punk band who really cares about like labor unions. Yeah. Like, again, so I would be like, <laughs> you know, when when I see, you know, Scratch 21 out at the May Day protests, um, <laughs> you know, arm in arm with, the, you know, our, our union brothers and sisters, then like absolutely – uh, you know, I'm happy to sort of uh, give When I that. see this picture I just sent you, though, I do kind of understand how people get lost in this world. Like, 
there's this there's this phoebe has drawn this picture that's like so high res and in depth and you can just see all these creatures just hanging out in their house one of them's writing one of them's chilling at the computer listening to music one of them's on their phone one of them's tuning up his guitar there's an enema of the state furry poster on the wall like you look at this and you're like i could look at this picture for quite a while and i wish i was friends with these people so here's not necessarily a, it, in a sexual way but. <laughs> but here's the thing right so it's not sexual but as you pointed out you know you've got four f- they're furries right i mean that's what this is uh hanging out in a recording studio and there is a poster of enema on the state on the wall but with a a, a furry eyes what, what, what's the term for that like where you turn up like something you recognize oh. furified. Yeah, I don't know. So the it cover of Adam be... Estate has been furified, which Persona? implies. Persona? Yeah. So, but this to me implies that in this world there are uh, furry porn stars, right? And, right. And yeah, there have to be. Yes. On the jacket, it's not just like a furry putting on a glove. It's a furry in a full uh, nurse's outfit, meaning that in this world, nurses and therefore you can presumably see the cleavage. Yeah. Presumably most professionals wear, uh, you know, a full, you know, at least top to work. And yet none of the oh, members yeah. of this band are wearing any clothes implying that they, you know, this is like some sort of free love. Um, you know, I don't know. Uh, I mean, at so least now you're, nudist. now you're shaming nudists. You're thinking that nudists are inherently sexual no matter what. Oh yeah. They're so sexual, man. Come on. <laughs> There's no, also look. like a um, there's a music chart on the other wall. There's so much. This, there's this a image lot. just keeps on giving. You and I are like really absorbed in this, which we're uh, like becoming furries in real time. Has anyone like you know we've had some great fan art, um, and you posted a few sort of joking ones, but like if if anyone listening to this is capable of producing uh, like fursona type fan fursona, art, fursona, please. I would yes, love I would love to have uh, to have a fursona. Obviously, I want period. mine to be wearing a diaper. Also, <laughs> please. <laughs> yeah. Um. So let's hear the. So let's hear Scratch Twenty One's cover. Unfortunately or fortunately, I don't know if this is normal for this kind of thing or not, but you'd expect there to be like an intense animated video to go with it, but they really just sort of bob back and forth. Yeah. And, play it. and but, that's my concern is but, I was like, it looks sick, but I wonder if it just sounds kind of normal and is just them playing it. But it's still like compelling. Yeah, like I'd like to learn more about this band and maybe like dig into it further, but let's just hear them covering Asthenia. It's basically like verbatim a lift of the song. Yeah, that's pretty much it. But like you know, uh, it was fine. Look, someone I, has actually, someone has even uploaded. I played it earlier. It's not worth. It's so identical. But somebody did like the left right channel with the original, and it just sounds like the original. Yeah. So, but uh, still interested in Scratch Twenty One and their activism. So hopefully we can hear uh, hear more about that perhaps on a future episode. Yeah, I mean Scratch Twenty One are activists first and foremost. Um, and then animal sex freak. <laughs> well, you and know who is <laughs> you know who is a, uh, an activist first, and uh, to my knowledge, not an animal sex freak is this week's guest. Now, <laughs> right? I, I we realized have do, we have to do final thoughts. Yeah, I got to pin first, that amazing uh, transition, and, and let's do our final thoughts <laughs> and then come so, back. Sorry to, to ruin it, but I just I cannot. Uh, diverge from the standard path that we've established. Of course, man. We must do final thoughts. <laughs> so, Josiah, what's your final thoughts uh, on the song Anesthesia and 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 <laughs> this this the the song of this episode that we're doing? Scus 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 by Blink One Eighty Two. I love it. It's so good. But I think this is supporting my theory more and more that. Um, really, really good Blink songs that they do perfectly cannot be covered in any sort of way that improves them. And despite some of these being kind of fun, they were only pointing to what we loved about the original. Whereas when we don't love a Blink song, there are there are covers that improve on it. Yeah, that's, that's sort of it for me. I mean, I, I think sort of understanding 
that what I didn't like about this song is is ultimately what has sort of protected this song. Uh, you know, it's like it's like an animal that is delicious but has like bright colors to uh, trick predators into thinking that it's poisonous. You know, that's really what this song has. Is it's got this sort of like bright plumage where you say, mm, "Not sure about that," and then you bite in. And you're like, "This frog is delicious." <laughs> That's a uh, that's the sort of metaphor that a newly minted furry would make, I think. <laughs> yeah, I think so. Just love to eat frogs. So, activism this week. <laughs> oh, look, yeah, it, we're not remember that segue that you did? <laughs> uh, it was so tight. Listen, here's why the, here's why this segue does fit with this because I think around this time, hanging out with cool kids, um, as I did, not to brag, I did have some cool friends as well as some fucking nerd ass loser friends. But hanging around the cool kids around this era of Blink-182 especially, it was, like, the least cool music you could possibly be into. And people, like, like I feel like if I had played this admittedly fantastic song back then for a certain group of friends, they would not have been able to cope with it. And so I think that's sort of an interesting parallel to music today that is roasted for being awful to some ears that clearly has some merit that maybe we don't understand. Yeah, I think that's fair. I mean, you know, we talked about this a little bit in the episode with uh, Jessica Hopper that I'm curious what a, a sort of true punk's angle on Blink would have been at the time that you and I fell in love with it because we didn't have the context that sometimes breeds cynicism or just the cynicism that is occasionally unfounded. And so you were reacting somewhat cynically on Twitter to a tweet storm from a very famous musician. Like, I just, I don't know if you get into this in the interview because I haven't listened to it yet, but I, I think like, I, I, only, I just need I, you to I, paint I only, a picture of what happened a couple of days ago. Yeah, there needs to be some setup, I think, because it, like, I still can't believe this happened and it's so funny to me and it took a radio station plagiarizing us for me to stop laughing about this for like 48 hours. Yeah. Um, there's this guy, I don't even really know what his name is, but he, he listens to the pod a lot. His name is L-O-R-A-N-D-K-O-N-C-Z. Lauren, I think, maybe? Lauren D or Laurend? I don't know. He's like a He sings in a band. He follows me on Twitter. Um, I follow him back, and I saw him share this tweet from the Imagine Dragons guy, and he had just written, like, grow up or something. or You know, like, we all get annoyed when when people we assume are, like, on top of the world to kind of whine on Twitter. Like I get mad at when I, whenever I see the guy from grizzly bear, like whining about how hard it is to like tour or whatever, even though it is, I don't know why I just, but touring for grizzly I bear is easier than touring is for prenup. So you're always like, dude, tours not well, hard. You just, have a bus, you get to stay in a hotel, yada, yada, yada. Yeah. Right? There's that aspect. But also I generally think that unless you're, actually making a joke or creating something of value for the people who follow you i'm always annoyed when people whine on social media like if you have a migraine tell your close friend about it or your loved one but don't just like put it out there to your followers because it doesn't you know what i mean like yeah or like if you're mad that a radio station lifted seconds of content from your (laughs) three-hour podcast well i mean you shouldn't spend 48 hours (laughs) mobilizing a tiny army of fan accounts to (laughs) that actually is fantastic but if you had just said like oh such a dumb day (laughs) yeah i I totally agree totally agree there needs to be some focused uh, juice to it for your followers. You gotta so focus anyways, your juice. I, I <laughs> so Dan Reynolds had been doing this whole thing about how he hates, like he's so sick of hipsters getting to decide what's cool or not, and he he's sick of being the target of everyone's vitriol and and being made fun of, and like who are you gonna go for next? And he was mentioning how you know the list of bands that just get shat on because they become easy punchlines um along with imagine dragons it would be he mentioned like mumford and sons and the chain smokers and stuff um and so he had done this whole thing where the other ironic thing is that it seems like a lot of his followers thought that he was like losing it a little bit because he was being so unfiltered um but i shared just the one where he said he was sick of hipsters because i think it's so funny to me that people still even use that word since a hipster is just somebody who has like hyper specific taste, which mm-hmm. is everyone on earth. So I kind of was just making fun of that. Like, Oh, finally someone's making fun of hipsters. And then <laughs> Jake Goldsby, former guest of the pod, uh, weighed in and was like, he said something like, uh, Oh yeah, th- I love hearing complaining from the millionaire rock star or whatever. Uh, and then my friend Cam Reed, uh, from he lives in Toronto. I don't, I think he's, he's somewhat friend of maybe acquaintance of the pod. 
at this point but he tweeted something like oh kanye has emboldened the worst of our society to speak out and you know we we're just all like kind of dunking on it innocently enough making fun of it but i forgot that like when you're verified on twitter the famous people only look at their verified tabs so they definitely they always see when you make fun of them <laughs> because you, they, they see that so he saw and he replied and he was like um I probably should have had this ready to go before we started. This. I mean, he basically just did a point by point kind of takedown where he was like, you know, first of all, like a couple of points for making me wonder if this was sarcastic. And then, you know, a few points for, you know, uh, the the Kanye thing. And then like he signed it. Or he said, yeah, he said a few points for calling me rich, rich, rich or whatever, but no points for the Kanye thing, even though it's funny. I don't know why he said that. But and then he signed it. Rich Grammy guy, um, which one of my friends changed their uh, their Twitter handle to Rich Grammy <laughs> yeah. after that. But, like, I was sort of – I was, like – I thought it was so funny and surreal. So then I messaged him and was like – or, no, sorry. Then I replied and was like, do you want to talk about this on a Blink-182 podcast? And he was like, only if we get to talk about Tom and aliens and if you tell me that you love Imagine Dragons. <laughs> and I was like, yeah, but – like, I was I knew he was joking, but I was like, yo, I'm actually serious, though. And then he DM'd me, <laughs> like, right away. <laughs> And, and so he, he said, yeah, uh, so he DMs you because I was, he said I to wa- me, oh my God, it was, it was so surreal. He DM me and he wrote, he, he wrote, well, shit, never agreed to do a podcast under these specific circumstances, but hey, let's break bread and talk aliens. Um, and then he, he like, he's, they're on tour in Australia right now. <laughs> so maybe Maddie will go see them. Um, but he, he like, he was like, yo, I have to do it like right now. Like, can you talk in 10 minutes? And I was at the post office. So I had to run home. <laughs> I um, didn't know that. That's good. <laughs> Yeah, so I ran home, uh, and then we talked, and honestly, i got to say, I have never, truly, because we all know how much of a cynical asshole I am, I've never spoken to someone with this much humility about their own music. It's very interesting and very um, transparent about things that everyone can relate to, which is just like wanting approval versus wanting to just do whatever you want and kind of there's so many interesting themes but then i was kind of worried because i wanted it to be ska season and i was like fuck it's not going to be ska season anymore we're not going to talk about ska on this episode and then he just revealed to me that he used to play in a mormon ska oh band when he was 10 years old <laughs> so it's <laughs> So he has sent me three of his old ska songs. One of them you will hear on this episode. One of them you will hear on the ska season Sclusi. And one of them, his previous band members said, is too embarrassing for us to ever play. <sighs> Meaning, I am like the Martin Shkreli of um, Imagine Dragons <laughs> ska songs. Because I have a contraband oh ska song that no one can ever hear on my computer. Well, maybe that could be part of the like $100, $500 Patreon tier. And like we, you know, he can just deal with it or whatever. <laughs> yeah, I don't I don't want him to know that I mean that as far as I've made a pact with my new friend Dan from Imagine Dragons <laughs> that I won't share that song so yeah look and I don't want to like you know waste any more time getting to this because I'm I, I'm personally very excited to hear this conversation but it, it truly is and I'll just say this briefly it's a reminder of like how kind of ultimately small the world is and how and this is this is corny, and I don't know if, if you agree with this, and I'm sorry to make it about this, but like literally talking to people is so important, and no one ever does it because all we do is try to be funnier than everyone else on Twitter and just dunk on on people. And for him to be like, sure, I'll do your pop, you got to tell me you fucking love Imagine Dragons, and you're like, hell yes, I will. And then you guys are on Skype <laughs> 20 minutes later talking about ska is to me like. You know, that's not. And we have a. We actually. We also have a ska email thread that was, that went on for hours after. Like, like we kept going back and forth about ska. Well, so I just I know it's it's absurd. Like for him, it just seems like it's a like. Obviously, he's a fundamentally good dude. I mean, first of all, I don't know if you talk about it in the pod, but like his entire the last year of his life has been dedicated to LGBTQ activism inside of the Mormon Church, which has historically been yeah. We uh, talk about it. Yeah, great. It. So it's, I mean, a like that's it. Like you know, whatever you think of a person's like art, this is a guy who's literally dedicated having a, a huge platform to doing something important. And like fuck us because we've never done anything like that. But like. Just to have so much fun with, like, you're just, like, a, a, a fucking dude on the internet, and I, I know it's not, like, Israel and Palestine, but it fills me with, like, <laughs> really genuine joy to just know that he was, like, kind of, like, having a snarky day, and 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 then you guys ended up, and you were having a snarky day, and you ended up having this, this great scat is, uh... <laughs> 
I don't know. I just like it, it makes it makes me feel really it was, good. It and, was and encouraging, I it. and I also I also really like what he says. I mean, I'm describing what you're about to hear, but I also really like how he says that he actually liked that I was making fun of him. Like it was in good fun, and he actually laughed about it, and he enjoyed it, and like he doesn't want he doesn't want people to also like treat him with kid gloves and stuff. So I think it's cool, and I think that bands like that are more interesting and this truly is what blink was like at the time even though we all we look back now and love blink but it, that is truly what they're like and i think it's really interesting sort of to be that kind of band rather than just to be the band that everyone loves that gets forgotten later hell yeah you know what i mean well should we stop describing the interview and actually listen to it <laughs> yeah so here's me with my new friend dan reynolds of imagine dragons <laughs> So we are here with, I can't believe that we're talking right now. This is the power of the internet. Uh, we're here with Dan Reynolds from Imagine Dragons. What's going on? Hey, hey, hey. I <laughs> uh, just got back to the States and home for a week before heading, heading back on tour. Thanks for having me. Yeah, thank you so much for doing this. So this start this conversation started in a very weird way. Um, I was just, <laughs> I was being a snarky little shit on my Twitter, as I tend to do. Uh, and I forgot that I have a verified check, meaning that you see it definitely. Yeah, um, yeah. so, but yeah, so today you're sort of, or yesterday you've been kind of talking about, I mean, a lot of big things, but it seems like at least from, from an outsider perspective, it seems like you're sort of, it's getting to you sort of the, the nose turned up elitism of people who might be poking fun at you or whatever. Is that fair to say? Or, you know, I think. You know, I, to be honest, I'm sure, I mean, I've been in, you know, the band now for years and, you know, that it's nothing new to kind of be in a band and have people love it and hate it. So I, I wouldn't say that it's so much like recently I'm, I'm upset over things like that. In fact, I really made more peace with that uh, early on in my career. But um, with that being said, I, I think it's more just the overall state of being uh, on the internet is just a, it's a real bummer to me. Um, and I've just had so many friends who are in the industry and watched how it kind of makes artists so jaded. I mean, jaded, are, jaded isn't the correct, the correct word. Like artists are already very sensitive people. Right. Um, and then so, and, and they're people just, you know, like everybody else. And granted, a lot of them are successful. And so you can't like moan about life. You know what I mean? So, Cause yeah. nobody wants to hear a successful person moan, but at the end of the day, it's still someone, you know what I mean? Who's sitting at home and goes to sleep and like, you know what I mean? And wakes up and like they, it's, it's, they have a life, you know what I mean? So I don't know. And, and so for me, I guess I've, I've really gotten involved with just mental health period over the last couple of years. Cause I've dealt with depression for a lot of years and it's been kind of a journey for me. And I, I don't know. Um, that being said, it, you know, I certainly am no, I'm not perfect. And I absolutely find myself being like, Oh man, I, I hate this or I hate that. Or like, you know, being snarky about stuff. So I don't think there's, to, to me, like the reason that I even want to jump on this with you is first to be like, look, I, I actually like, it made me laugh. Like what you said, like I, <laughs> right. I read it and then I was like, Oh, he's being sarcastic. Oh, you know what I mean? Like I'm not. Yeah. So to yeah, clarify, gonna, this will come yeah. out on Friday to clarify what you had said. I didn't even see the whole thread because I didn't follow you until right now, but you had done a, a, a thread about like, um, how people who love to hate on things, may as well just be hipsters or whatever and to let you know the reason i was making fun of it mostly is because in my mind the word hipster is so like it's like a, a dumb almost like a slur from five years ago that just describes people who like dress good or something like in my mind the word hipster just like <laughs> right, doesn't right. mean anything anymore like the reason that you have facial hair or i have a mustache is because of what hipsters did or you know like it just, it just moves culture forward essentially yeah, I so i was kind of making fun of that aspect and then uh, a bunch of people piled on and yeah. it was it was all in good. And the comments it, were pretty funny, actually. Yeah, yeah it, it I, was I all in good fun. I appreciated like the Kanye. Yeah, I thought it was pretty funny because <laughs> I feel like you can't say anything right now. That's like if you're being like if you're just being honest or saying something, it's automatically like a Kanye thing now. Like yeah. he owned he owned like speaking your heart. You know what I mean? Which is <laughs> yeah. it's silly. It's silly. Yeah. I mean, I love personally. I love Kanye. I think he's like I, I don't agree with him in on all his aspects, but I do think that there's a real beauty to him always speaking off the cuff and it getting him into trouble trouble and i don't know i think that that's actually a really fantastic way to live right well um, i mean it makes the wor world a little more colorful you know if i'm being honest with you i i truly don't 
love Imagine Dragons, but I also don't hate Imagine Dragons. Like, I think I can see sort of, as I get older, I see the bigger picture. And you were talking about the Chainsmokers and Mumford and & Sons and other bands like that, too. And I can see the bigger picture of, like, we're, as a culture, we're kind of scared of artists who are, like, thinking outside of the box. And if we don't process it right away, like... Now, like 10 years later, I actually think Nickelback is awesome, but I used to totally talk about right. them all the time. So it's kind of weird how like as culture moves on, we get more used to these big ideas. But I also think like in order to be an artist, if you want to be interesting, you have to sort of toe that line of stuff that people might find too audacious or something or too Totally, cheesy. totally. And, and, and the truth is at the end of the day, once something becomes commercialized, it's it's never going to have like as much value to anybody because it feels so uh, shared. Like it feels so contrived or it feels like, cause too many people like it. You know what I mean? So for yeah. me, it's like, and, and I guess a lot of, I have a lot of friends that are in some of those bands I mentioned and a lot of other bands who, you know, some of which are doing great and some of them which have serious mental health issues and it would be totally false for me not to say that they have somewhat to do with their life, like mental health issues. Of course, I'm sure there's like, for some people it's like genetic or some people it's environmental or it's how you were raised or, you know, there's so many things that play into it, but absolutely for some people, it's also your, you know, it's, it's environmental. So if you're living in a world where you feel, you know, worthless and you have a lot of people who are telling you you're worthless, even if you're the biggest artist in the world, whether it's, like, I mean, even like, I don't, I, I don't want to like sit, name drop or something because I, I feel like everybody should be able to speak their own truth and I shouldn't speak it for them. But I will say there are many big artists that I can tell you who have like really had serious mental issues because of being bullied. Um, and so for me, there, there's just a different, like I have a deep respect for critics. I have a, like, even though our band gets so much shit for critics, I still have like a deep respect for critics. Cause I understand that that is a necessary part of driving art forward. And for me, there's a lot that I've learned throughout the years. And trust me, like, even though I'm a singer for Imagine Dragons, it's not like it's hard for me to listen to my own music and hard for me to appreciate my own music as an artist always. Um, and, and that's just the way it is. So, you know, I, I understand, I, I get it. I more was just trying to make a note of, Hey, there's a line between being a critic and there's a line between being like a bully. Like when I see people who make comments that are just like, I wish you died and not this person or, you know what I mean? Even if right. they're saying it with like dark humor, I'm just like, you know, that person doesn't know you. Yeah. They don't know that you're saying that with dark humor. And that person might be in a really bad spot and like sitting in a hotel room by themselves with a prescription pills like next to them. Like it's, it's a dangerous game. You know what I mean? So for me, I just, I want to shed a light on like, there's a way to still like, for, like, for instance, like I said, like with your, your comment, I was like, Oh, this is snarky and funny. Like I didn't read that and be like, Oh my gosh, this hurts. You know what I <laughs> right. mean? Plus, like I said, I've been in the, I've been in this industry for such a long time and I've dealt like, wait, with so much more than that. When you're in like, the biggest rock band in the world, quote unquote rock, that's totally like pop. Like I love pop. You know what I mean? That's what I grew up on, but we got lopped into kind of like, we became the token rock band and that's fine. Like I'm cool with that. But I, I know, like, I grew up listening to a lot of garage music. I, li I listened to a lot of grunge. For instance, one of the things, like, one of the first things I did when I saw your comment was I was like, oh, you're in a band. So then I clicked on the band. I was like, oh, this is rad. It's like, you know, I, I get where you come from, which is a world of, like, garage rock. And, I like, what yeah. was, there was one, one of the songs I really liked. It was called uh, On the Nose or something. Oh, like thanks so much. That's but anyway, crazy. But I really wanted to click on it and be like, oh, this is terrible. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, well, it's, it's and, funny and that you – back, And feel it back to you. But, it's funny but that you long, even bring that up because it's like it, on a – people are saying – you know, people say like, oh, you're rich. So who gives a shit? You're successful. But like we actually just put that record out last week and I've been on a minor minuscule scale of what your life must be like reading all the comments, like looking for – who who faved my post who didn't who ignored it like you just there's so much insecurity tied with whatever you put out into the world no matter what you're an artist yeah you're an artist and that's the thing at the end of the day you know 10 people can tell you i love like i love this and then but you're looking for that one comment of the person saying i hate this and you and you as an artist you hang on to that like the critic's voice is always the loudest you know what i mean and, yeah, yeah. and, and you know and, that, and that's an okay thing because at least for me i've grown to like 
I wouldn't say like I love it, but I would say it's a necessary part of our, my my growth as an artist because I listen to our records and I think, oh my gosh, like there is correctness to this, and this is too vanilla, and this, you know, and 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 I spent a lot of my life. I was born and just to give you like a small background on I me, mean, I was raised Mormon. Right. Um, yeah, I know that because I was going to ask you about your documentary as well because hilariously. And I want to talk to you about Tom and Aliens. You're not going to get off the phone without talking about that. Quickly, but <laughs> but I, I'm also a film critic for my full-time job uh, at Explain oh, cool. Magazine. So I was at Sundance this year. You were at Sundance this year. And Tom DeLong was at Sundance this year. Oh, I didn't know Tom was there. I saw him on, on Instagram because I stalk him, obviously, for this podcast. And I was like, God damn, <laughs> where's Tom? I need to find Tom. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, you know, it's – but – you know, the, the point of, of anyone who's been raised in a really strict Orthodox religious home, well, I can't say everybody, but at least for me, it really caused me to live a very non-offensive life. Like I right. never wanted to hurt someone. I never wanted to say anything that would be hurtful. I never wanted to hurt my mom's feelings. I never wanted to like, you know what I mean? Like Mormons are exactly, I mean, not exactly, but they play to that cliche that you see in the Book of Mormon musical, which is like, hello, my name is, El-. you know what I mean? It's very like, <laughs> life is good. And you know what I mean? So yeah, yeah. for me, it's taken, it's, it's taken as sad as it sounds like people throwing blows at me to kind of break my, like my sheltered life of like, life is easy. Cause it's, it's not, and there's going to be, you know what I mean? But I'm grateful for that because it got me to a point now where I'm 30 and it's like for the first time, I'm okay to offend people. Like for right. instance, the, doc, the documentary coming out, I already know it's it's going to offend a lot of people. It's going to offend a lot of people who are or, of, of Orthodox faith, and and that's just and and I'm okay with that. But it took me a long time to get there. Yeah, that's um, sick. That's yeah. that's sick, dude. That's awesome. Um, well, I guess the the other thing is like, what option do you really have other than to just kind of rise above it? I guess. Totally. Right? And that is, that must be why it sucks so bad. <laughs> yeah. But you know what? It's the truth is there's somewhere in the middle because I feel like I don't, I don't, for instance, I don't want to live in a world where you don't get on Twitter and make a snarky comment or I get on Twitter and make a snarky comment. Like, I feel like that, that's funny. Like that's that you need to have that humor in life right. to be able to like get through what is already a really dark life. Like there's, there's a certain beauty to that. You know what I mean? And if everybody was always like, Hey man, I love you. And I love your music. <laughs> like, then it's, great then, then, you know it, what I mean? then it becomes meaningless, right? Then everything totally. is just good. Um, there's a dude that comes on our podcast named Robin, who's a sort of a character we invented, who just says everything's good all the time. Because even on our podcast, like I shit on Blink-182 all the time, but it's because I love them. But I think right. maybe oh. the issue is like when you have so many followers on Twitter, there's bound to be people who just lack the social skills to sort of make banter with you in a fun way That's that totally. everyone's kind of giggling. I don't know. I don't envy it, that's for sure. But I guess my question is like, what even is Imagine Dragons music? Like the you said something about you do no genre, and I agree. But I think maybe that's why some of us just aren't able to connect sure. with it right away. Like there's, but that's better than just doing another like fucking garage band like me or whatever. You know what I mean? Like you know what the truth is? No, no, no. Actually, I, I, I for the record, like I think I would say this. I since I was young, since I was twelve years old. All I have done with music has been a journal entry for me. It's always been like I, I, when I, whenever I was dealing with my own insecurities, I'd sit down and I'd just make music. And originally, all my music when I was young was just a cappella. Like it was because I could, I had a cheap mic and I could, we, I could play the piano and that was it. But our piano was in the other room from the computer, so I got on this program, Cakewalk, and I would just like record myself doing like uh, melodies over like beatbox kind of thing, like strange, weird music. Right and and, and I never, um, I don't know, I grew up on so much hip hop and then I got lopped into a rock band and I think that, that made a really strange thing. Like I grew up on like Biggie and Tupac and really like nineties hip hop. Like th th all I listened to was like nineties hip hop and like Outkast and, and, uh, and Dre and Eminem. And so then, you know, I, I started a band with a guitarist and a bass player and a drummer who were all from Berkeley, who are these incredible musicians. But it, it, it just is a strange juxtaposition. And plus, then I'm Mormon, and it was like, you know, really clean living. And like, so that all yeah, made yeah. its way. So I, I, like, I'm not, like, I can totally see from an outsider how Imagine Dragons is like, oh, this feels very, like, uh, pop-centric, and it's supposed to be rock, because, you know, that's that's what we get lopped in. But 
and we have a guitar and there's like nobody who has guitars anymore. So it's like, oh, they have a guitar. They must be a rock. <laughs> but I don't know. I, I, I really uh, I can't I can't put it in a genre. And I and, I, and the truth is, I really don't care about genres. Um, and I don't know. I, you know, I, I love I love Imagine Dragons and what it stands for more as a culture. And, and I, of course, like I want to say I love my music, but I, I if I were to be perfectly honest with you. I don't think I've ever loved my music. I think I've always felt like, uh, you know, as an artist, you just hate, I, I hate everything I do, but right. it's still part of my process. That's a, I, I think I that's a sign it. that you're a, that's a sign that you are probably on the right path because I think that if people are too stoked on their own music, that's probably not, they're probably a little bit delusional. Like you should always be sort of, trying to find that perfect version of what you're setting out to do probably. Yeah. And you know, and I honestly, one thing that really prepared me really well for the industry was I have seven older brothers because Mormon families are huge, obviously. Right. And all of them, you know, when I was making music growing up was like, this is shit. Like <laughs> they were like, I hate this. Please stop playing your music. I don't want to hear it. You know what I mean? And it would give me like so much worse, like anything than any critic could ever say to me. So when the music kind of went on, you know, went to the mainstream and it blew up and we got signed and all this stuff, I think I was prepared for the onslaught of love and hate. You know what I mean? And yeah. you kind of take, and you can't complain because I'm like, oh, this is I'm living the dream. You know what I mean? And for the ten people who hate your band, there's there's ten people who love your band. So well, that's I think better yeah, than all success, prob- all yeah. success probably feels like it comes with some sort of asterisk where you're like, ah, oh, I just wish this one thing. Like I don't know if you've ever seen the Ricky Gervais show Extras. Um, yeah, did after the like it reminds me of that sort of like. He got what he wanted. He got this TV show, but it wasn't like critically acclaimed. And that was always bummer. Right. Not all the time. <laughs> totally. And you know what? I think that's such a necessary thing, to be honest, because I think if you were creating music and it was, first of all, it was loved by everybody, which I think there are like, I can think of a couple people who ride the line of being massively successful and commercial, but also critically acclaimed. And it's, and it's, it's, it's a small amount of artists. And the ones who do it pull it off really well. Like for instance, Kendrick. Kendrick is a perfect like example mm. to me of somebody who is very authentic, very cool. Like critics love him, and his music is massive, and nobody deserves it more. Like I, in, in the time I've spent with Kendrick, he's one of like the best human beings I know. Been with the same girl since high school. Like doesn't care about anything other than just creating art. Right. Um, but so he's pulled it off well. But what I was going to say is I do think it's a dangerous game. When somebody is, you know, nobody is saying this is bad because that's yeah. where like a false god god complex comes from, and then it's never enough. Like that person is never going to, you know, they're ne- they're always even the person who is loved by everybody is still reading the one person that hated them and bummed about Absolutely. it. You Absolutely, know I mean? and it's also that powerful. and they're not going to push themselves enough that they're going to end up being a one hit wonder, which is not totally. you guys. Which I thought that when I first heard Radioactive, I was like, oh probably this song is blowing up so quickly. I doubt we'll hear from them again, but then okay, you're still yeah. here. You're still, you're still killing it. So this is a Blink-182 podcast. <laughs> some purposes. Have you ever had like a punk phase in your life? Did you ever listen to Blink-182? You know, in middle school, um, when I was like, so in the nineties, I definitely got down with like Enema of the State, like just, just their most mainstream pop stuff. Like I never, Duh. I, I don't even know what their earlier albums were before that. I know they had albums before Enemy of the State. Um, I want to say uh, Take Off Your Pants and Jacket. I knew like one or two songs off it. I don't know. I wouldn't say it was like – it was too uh, It was too risque for me. I couldn't like right. – in order to listen to it, I had to like hide it. You know what I mean? I wasn't even allowed to go to shows growing up because I was Mormon. Was there so a like never... Mormon punk? Because I, I grew up very Christian. There was a ska. There was a – what was that Mormon ska Shut band? Shut up, dude. Are you serious? Uh, we're in, we're in um, ska season right now on the podcast. Oh, who is so it? Is uh, the Aquabats. The Aquabats. Oh, yeah. They Do were Mormon. Them? Yeah. They're all, they were all Mormon. They had that song. Other like, than Travis, who joined Blink Me Too after he quit. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So he, uh, I actually got to meet them, and we we filmed like a little thing with them and Jack Black. It was really rad for some like kids thing they were making. But um, yeah, I, I actually was in a ska band. <laughs> like when ska was a thing, I played the saxophone in a ska band in high school. Oh, that's and it was, so sick. It was yeah, it was called Super Ted, and it was. Re- I actually should send you one of the songs, and you should. I should have you play it on the podcast. Oh my god, it's please so do. bad. Please yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll send you one of the songs. But it, uh, to be honest with you, like when I listen back at it, it wasn't as bad as – I don't even want to say this because because then you're going to play it and everyone's going to be like, this is terrible. <laughs> but I actually listened to it. I was like, you know what? This is pretty good. We did a cover of um, – I don't know if you know – did you know Dr. Demento? Yeah, of course. Yeah, like okay. Rudell vibes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So Dr. Demento had this, this skit, um, Boot to the Head. It was like, like – uh, 
I, I can't even like it, it, it's like basically there it's like a you know everything they do were like comedy sketches but anyway we took that boot to the head skit and then turned it into a song so maybe i'll send you that one here we go people talking in movie shows people smoking in bed people voting a democrat well we give them a boot to the head We've declared that Scott is back this year. We're just making it happen. Like, Scott, it's time for Scott to come back. But it's sort of like a similar uh, parallel to what we're talking about. Like Ska or even Blink-182 was like their songs were too catchy and too huge at the time. And people shat all over them all the time. And, and they didn't have critical reception. It's interesting even just like something might land at the wrong time for totally. snobs. And then they're not into it. But then 10 years later, there's sort of like an ironic appreciation for Blink-182 or Ska, hopefully, this year. And that, Yeah, and that happens a lot. And I think one of the things that was hard for them, just from an outsider's point of view, was to, to claim to be in, like, the punk genre at all, which I always thought of them as, like, pop punk, you know? Yeah. Um, that's – it's so difficult because you're going to have, like – you're trying to appeal to people who love punk – rock which are typically people who want to be outsiders and are edgy and like want to like they want to feel like they're part of like an elite select group of like uh politically like forward progressive like there's it, it's just it's a tough genre to be a part of and it, you have to be very authentic so then when you add pop to that you're already setting yourself up to like you know what i mean it's like that's totally. a just that's like, it's like you're, you're damned if you do damned if you don't a- I, to be honest i actually have felt a little bit like in some ways that's been the bane of imagine dragons because it's like we are yeah. held as like the rock like we you dominate saying, yeah you keep the mentioning rock the rock thing, thing. Yeah. and there's no one there's truly no one carrying the rock torch right now whether it's because the labels aren't marketing rock bands on such a grand scale or whatever it is there's no rock bands right now and i, I agree it's not really fair for imagine dragons to have to be the rock band well i would rather be ju- to be honest i'd rather be judged as like urban dark pop because that's that's on genuinely what Imagine Dragons is is pop. It's like it's dark pop, but yeah. because it's dark pop, it's like put in the alternative thing, which is kind of I feel like it's unfair for alternative acts because then it's like and here are the charts for the end of the year. Here's all these real alternative acts, and then there's this one huge pop band that's outselling everybody in the alternative <laughs> world. Yeah, and, and so it's you set yourself up for disaster. So look, the truth is I get it, and the, and if I wasn't in Imagine Dragons. And I was in some other alternative band. I'd be like, "Screw Imagine Dragons," you know what I mean? Right. Like, because I'd probably have like a label call, and my label being like, "Hey, I want you to write a song like Imagine Dragons." You know what I mean? I'd be <laughs> yeah. like, "Forget that," you know. So I, yeah. I get it. I get it. You know, dude. Well, good for you to to come on this lowly Blink One Eighty Two podcast and uh, speak your truth because I, I hear you, and I think it's it's important to find that fine line between like having some banter. And also people saying like sketchy shit to you about that you should kill yourself or something. That's fucked up. That's, yeah, that's yeah. gross. But, um, I don't know. I, I'm going to, I'm going to give Imagine Dragons a fairer shake. So I'm going to, maybe should I put on the newest album or what? I like, I, I like the song <laughs> yeah, Thunder. I, mean, I, that's I, I sick. put on the newest. I think the newest album is, is, is the best cause it's, we actually really embraced the pop sensibility, like opposed to being like. You know, I think the worst thing we could have done, which we never did, thank goodness, I think after your first record goes successful, every young band who goes commercial wants to be like, well, you know what? Now we're going to make a real, like, critical album. Like, we're going to make an album that, you know, is not poppy. Yeah. And, I've seen, I've seen, and I've seen a lot of bands do that that are total pop bands. And then they put out their second record and the critics still hate it. And then it doesn't do good either. And you're just like, screwed. <laughs> yeah, so that's, I think Evolve for me was like, let's make a brilliant great pop record and i'm pr- like at the end of the day like like i said like i pretty much hate everything i've ever done in music you could like listening back on it even the thought of you listening to it right now i'm like oh geez <laughs> but with that being said you know I'm, if there was a record that i think is indicative of imagine dragons i'd say it's evolved yeah other than your ska uh project. other than yeah and i will send you that by the way Food to please the do oh my god yeah, i'll send it to you i'm you should, so you excited should and, okay. and so just finally to plug your movie when will people be able to see it it's called believer is that right believer yeah it comes out uh i actually just we just played it at the montclair film festival last night and did a really rad uh q a afterward with stephen colbert and it comes out on hbo 
June 25th. Um, and, and it's then about it, like LGBT issues with within the Mormon about, church. Yeah. It's basically about how Mormon teachings as well as any Orthodox faith are killing our LGBT youth because you're, you're setting them up with no options for a healthy life, which is you can either be celibate or you can be in a mixed orientation marriage, which we have tons of research that shows you tell that to any child, you're, their chances at suicide, depression, anxiety are just through the roof. And I had a bunch of friends growing up who were gay and Mormon and super conflicted. And some of them I lost to suicide. And so for me, I just, and I got kicked out of my call. I went to BYU and I got kicked out of BYU at, which was like a super guilt inducing experience for me. So I had like on a minor scale, what uh, queer youth go through when they're in, you know, like Orthodox faith. So right. the goal is to shine a light, a light on that and put pressure on all Orthodox religion to change. And if they like, if they don't change, for at least the families within Orthodox religion to, to take a second look at their beliefs. Because if you tell your child that it's sinful to be gay, you right then are setting them up eight times more likely to take their life. Eight times more likely Jeez. just for teaching that, that principle. So that's crazy. But yeah, so that's, that's the goal of the documentary is to, to shine a light on that. Damn. Well, I can't wait to see it. Thank right you. On. Thank you so much, Dan. Much respect for you coming on here, stepping into the snark <laughs> den. <laughs> no, man, I love it. I love it. Keep being snarky, and, uh, <laughs> and and we'll talk about aliens one of these days. Oh yeah, shit. Well, very quickly, do you think Tom? Oh God, I wanted to bring that up because I think, Tom, I think Tom is. I think Tom is totally legit. Anybody who tries to argue that he's not legit at this point has not looked into it enough. Like if you, you go like watch Reddit, his video, you're like, this is real. It is. He has like now. all the ex CIA. Like he's, it's he's to me like, I I I'm so in on it, and I love for. I mean, I'm a little bit biased because I already am like a total sci-fi nerd and want so badly to find aliens before I die. Like that is like my biggest goal, and I feel like anybody who's uh, pushing that forward and actually putting time and effort and money into it is already I like have mad respect for. But the fact that he is like this deep involved i don't know i believe him really i i, I, I do i do too for real i do there's that. legit people on his team now like Dude, he, well, he can't, he can't fake that use some of your uh, rich guy grammy money to sign up for to the stars academy because you can become <laughs> a stockholder right now if you want yeah i saw that i well i saw that it it looked like it was five dollars or whatever but it's like two hundred dollars i think to buy it <laughs> But uh, yeah, maybe I'll sell my Grammy. I'm gonna sell my Grammy and buy stocks in the stock. Please, please do. What is it? See the stars? Is that what it's called? See to, the stars. To the, star, to the, stars, the stars Academy. Yeah. To the Stars Academy. <laughs> I'll check it out. All right. Thank you so much, Dan. All right, man. Take care. Have a good one.